So I think um, before we start, I think I'm, I'm going to ask Jennifer, the, the uh, assistant town manager, to address the issues, the logistical issues of this meeting uh, before, before we start the proceedings. So Jennifer. Thank you. So this is a webinar platform of Zoom. So we have panelists are the people that you can see and who can uh, talk freely when the chair says that they can talk. Then we have attendees. When um, the chair opens a comment to the public, you can use your raise your hand feature if you're an attendee. And you can do that um, if you're calling in on your phone by pressing star nine and that will raise and lower your hand. Star six will mute and unmute you if you're calling in with your phone. Um, we're gonna give, uh, again, just like with the Zoning Board of Appeals, and they're hearing three minutes for attendees to speak um, when it's open up to the public to talk. And um, that's about it. Terrific, Great. thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for all that you've done in order to make this happen today. Um, and all the work that you've done behind the scenes. Um, we have a wonderful team in the town offices at Deerfield. Thank you. I'm going to open this meeting. Um, uh, it is now, according to my clock, 707, uh, October 15th, 2020. Um, and this evening, we are opening a public hearing um, to address the court ordered remand on the revised application of South Deerfield <clears throat> DG Series LC for site plan approval pursuant to section 5400 of the zoning bylaw and a stormwater permit pursuant to chapter 155 of the town code for the development of a 9.318 uh, 9,318 square foot Dollar General retail store and associated site improvements on approximately 1.99 acre site located northeasterly of Mill Village Road and westerly of Greenfield Road in Deerfield as further in, in identified in the town assessor's records as map 132, lots 29 and 30, situated in the commercial C2, commercial zoning district. So that's, uh, that's our task for this evening, our chief task. Uh, we do have on our minutes, uh, review of uh, mail and minutes. We have no minutes to review, so that's just terrific. Um, and we, we have no old business that we uh, plan on addressing this evening. And um, Annalie, do you have, yes, what's up? I'm sorry, procedural question. Um, Jen Jennifer was talking about uh, members of the public being able to speak for three minutes. Um, in the past, in some of the zoning board meetings, then the applicant responded. Um, is that going to be the process this time too? And if so, then is there back and forth? Or how does that work? I think we'll, we'll use our discretion at that point. I think that the statements, the initial statements of the public will be, we'll try to limit them. Um, to a time period so that we we move through our concerns in a, in a timely fashion. Uh, similarly with the response of the applicant, um, if it's something that has been addressed, if it's new information. But um, I think that at that point, Annalie, you're not a member of the public. We're on the board. We, we have to be able to answer, ask questions that get answered. So if we need to jump in at that point, we will do that. Um, that's not on the three minute. We're not on a three minute. <laughs> No one puts Rachel Blaine on a three minute time. <laughs> However, um, I am before we begin, I'd like to call on Adam Costa. He's the town attorney and he's been working with us um, on this, uh, um, this situation uh, with the, um, the legal issues. Uh, and maybe Adam can explain to us a little bit more about the remand and the tasks that we have in front of us this evening. Adam? So uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, good evening, uh, members and assistant town manager or town administrator, town administrator also. Uh, appreciate you uh, having me tonight. So um, what I'd like to do is just provide a bit of background. I know this is, is uh, somewhat unusual in the context of a, of a public hearing, but I think it's appropriate given that um, tonight's event was advertised as a, as a remand hearing and maybe not so much for the benefit of board members because um, since there was uh, and is underlying litigation, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, with uh, many of you and had the opportunity to meet with members of the select board in executive session several times over the past uh, year or more. Um, but really for the benefit of the public, um, public may see this uh, advertisement of a remand hearing and say, well, 
what does that mean? What is a remand hearing? Um, how did we get here? Why are we here? Knowing that this, uh, this Dollar General project was before the planning board uh, a year and a half or more ago, uh, and a decision was rendered denying site plan approval, uh, why are we back before the board? So um, I'm gonna talk first, and I'm gonna try to keep my remarks brief because I know we have a lot to cover tonight, and you don't wanna hear uh, me talking ad nauseum, but I do wanna talk a bit about the sequence of events and then talk a bit about the substance of what's before you. So as you know, uh, as the board knows, and as some members of the public know, this project was before you on an application for site plan approval and for a stormwater permit um, back in uh, early 2019, late, late 2018, early 2019. So coming up on two years, a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, as a consequence of that uh, public hearing process, the board voted to deny site plan approval. And there was an appeal of that denial to the Massachusetts Land Court. And we had an initial conference as is standard form in the land court in April of 2019. And at that initial conference, there was some discussion with the judge about the reality that site plan approval is not something that is typically uh, denied by municipal boards. And that's because unlike a variance that would be issued by a Zoning Board of Appeals, unlike a special permit that might be issued by a Zoning Board of Appeals, these are discretionary permits and approvals where there's a standard that if that standard is not met, the permit granting authority has complete discretion to deny the permit or approval. Unlike those permits and approvals, site plan approval is something that is typically attached to, affixed to, related to, um, as of right uses, or in this case, a use that is required to obtain a special permit from a different permit granting authority. And as you know, there's a, there's a proceeding underway now before the Planning Board of Appeals to obtain a special permit. And so site plan review is a tool that municipalities use to shape a project. It's not to say yay or nay to a project, it's to shape a project, to ask questions about how the project will be designed, what the layout will be, the sorts of materials that might be used in connection with um, the, the development, the construction of, of the building or structure. Um, and to fine tune the development so that um, from a planning perspective, uh, even aesthetically, the project is more palatable to the community. And so in light of the concerns raised by the judge and conversations that I had with the board in subsequent executive sessions, uh, it was agreed that it might make some sense to explore the potential of settlement if the applicant, the, the developer, were willing to make certain concessions and address certain items that had been of concern to the board that the board felt had not been fully or adequately addressed during the public hearing process. So we had a settlement meeting. We had, I had some preliminary discussions with your board and with the select board. In fact, I think I had two, maybe three separate executive sessions back in the good old days when we were doing them face-to-face -face before COVID-19 um, and got some feedback as to what those exact concerns were. And I communicated those to counsel for the applicant and the applicant provided some initial feedback and went back to the drawing board to some extent on some, some, uh, on some aspects of the development. And ultimately we conducted a settlement meeting in October of 2019 where there were a couple of representatives of the planning board present. There was a representative of the select board present and then of course representatives of the applicant, both the applicant's development team its engineer, its counsel, I was present myself. And we had a very lengthy meeting uh, there in town offices and worked through various issues. And the result of that meeting was what we believed was a settlement in concept. In concept because where the board had originally denied approval, you can't, at least it's not good government in my opinion, you simply can't make a deal in the back room behind closed doors to approve a project that was previously denied. So my recommendation in this context always to municipal boards that I represent is that if a settlement is achieved in concept, there ought to be a remand, which is essentially the court sending it back to the planning board for the planning board to conduct a new public hearing on the settlement that was achieved, the resolution that was achieved, and whether that is deemed to be acceptable by the whole board. And I did meet with the, the whole board after that meeting that occurred back in October of last year to be sure that I had permission to seek a remand in conjunction with the applicant. And I got that permission. 
And so we sought the remand together with the applicant's counsel. We got a remand order a few months ago. And here we are back before the planning board for the planning board to consider the components of that settlement. And that's what I suspect the applicant will be presenting to the board tonight, that settlement proposal, the aspects of the development that have, that have changed, that have been modified by the applicant at the request of, of, the, of the board uh, and the town. So that's what's to be considered tonight. Part of the reason for the remand is to also provide an opportunity for public comment and be very candid um, if and when the board approves the project to provide a further opportunity for appeal because you can't cut off neighbors, abutters, residents, any, any party in interest right to file an appeal if they so choose. And again, if we made a deal in the back room, that wouldn't be a possibility. And, and again, I don't believe that that's good government or consistent with uh, due process. So that's why we're here to consider an amendment. Um, that is what will be before you tonight. The standard, and I said I would speak briefly to the substance, and I, by that I didn't mean the substance of the amendment. You'll hear Attorney Donahue and, and his client speak to that. But I re will remind the board, and we can get back to this um, if and when the board chooses to deliberate on the application. But I refer you again to your zoning bylaw, specifically section 5400 of your zoning bylaw. That is the section that's entitled site plan review. And it provides both the process and the procedure but also the substance of what site plan review is and what the standard is that is to be applied. And in 5460, specifically 5461, 5462, all the way through 5469, you have a, a series of nine standards that are the standards that are to be applied in granting and appropriately conditioning a site plan approval. And they're, they're you know, they're wide ranging. They deal from things like you know, maximizing pedestrian and vehicular safety to minimizing glare from headlights or light intrusion onto neighboring properties to considering the departure or degree of departure from the character and scale of buildings in the vicinity. And you can consider those things in crafting your site plan approval and conditioning your site plan approval as you see fit. And so we can walk through those nine standards. I'm not going to do so now because, again, I don't want to take longer than my allotted time. But if and when the board begins to deliberate on the application that's before it, we ought to use those nine standards as the guide because that is the scope of your decision-making authority. We're not here to talk about um, the special permit criteria. Those are, are being talked about at present by the Zoning Board of Appeals in a series of public hearings that have been underway since January or February. We're not here to talk in great detail about um, Conservation Commission jurisdiction, the Wetlands Protection Act. The Conservation Commission has received a filing and is in the process of reviewing that filing um, and, and will continue to do so. We're here to consider the nine standards that are in the zoning bylaw and that's what you should be considering and that's what should be get guiding your decision making um, uh, process. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, thank you, Adam. Um, those nine standards actually, um, one of the things that I did not do, I'm sorry, at the opening of this, uh, while I assured us of a quorum, I wanna just take a quick roll call. So if um, members of the board could identify themselves with uh, their name and then just present. Um, let me start with Anna Lee. Anna Lee, you're muted. So I think Anna Lee Wolfkill, right? <laughs> nope, you're still muted. Still muted. Annalie Wolfpool, present. You can so, leave it unmuted unless you have dogs barking in the background. Denise. Denise Mason, present. Max. <laughs> Max. Max Antis, present. Thank you. Anne Mary. Anne Mary Cloutier, present. So we do have a quorum, which is wonderful. Um, I, I do want to point out, however, at this point that we have on the board um, three members who are new to us since the Dollar General project. So I think that at this point, um, it's appropriate that um, we call on uh, Mark Donahue. He's here to represent um, the project and uh, talk to us a bit about what the project looks like at this point. Um, so um, uh, those nine points uh, that Adam um, alluded to um, in 54, 61, et cetera, um, are fully in front of us, but they're um, not necessarily matched up for our new members. So this would be wonderful, uh, Mr. Donahue, for you to present the project as you <coughs> see it now. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board, Mark Donahue on behalf of the applicant. Um, and, and thank you to uh, my brother, Attorney Costa, for the summary as to the position of this matter and the, um, the limited jurisdiction uh, of the planning board. Uh, we do recognize that a number of board members present now did not have the pleasure of attending the previous meetings as board members. And so uh, we are going to, I'm going to ask with your permission, uh, Austin Turner uh, from Bowler Engineering, the design engineers, to review in a little bit more detail than we usually would for a remand, the site plan, uh, including issues that are to some extent not raised by uh, the appeal in and of itself. And I say that because we note that there were, of the nine criteria, uh, there were findings as part of the previous decision of the planning board that the applicant had met four of those criteria already. But I've asked him to still go through the process and point out in some detail uh, how the uh, plan works, and then, but really to focus on the changes since the uh, denial by the planning board that we have implemented. Uh, after he has an opportunity to do that, with your permission, um, traffic is, uh, is not surprisingly been an issue since this began. Uh, it continues to be an open discussion before the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, and your board deserves to understand uh, the heroic efforts of the applicant uh, with MassDOT uh, to be able to get agreement for a number of improvements to the intersection so as to render it much, much safer than existed before. And uh, with your permission, I'll have Mr. Kelly get into that after Mr. Turner's uh, presentation. So if I could ask Mr. Turner, and if he could share screen, he's got a number of slides, um, Madam Vice Chair, uh, that will help the board and the public understand um, a little bit better his presentation. Jennifer, um, if you could um, allow Mr. Turner share screen sharing privileges, that would be great. Yeah, he's able to do so. He has it on the bottom of his screen. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, good evening. For the record, Austin Turner with, with Bowler. Um, as, as both Attorney Costa and Attorney Donahue mentioned, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run through just kind of a, a review of the project for those who may or may not be familiar or who over the last year and a half or so may not have recalled every intimate detail of the project. So um, the project, I'll bring up my screen here so everybody can see the plan. Everybody see that all right? Yeah, we're okay, good. Great. So uh, what, what this project includes is the construction of a retail sales facility, uh, as was mentioned in the opening of approximately 9,319 square feet. The, the project um, does comply fully with the underlying bulk dimensional zoning requirements. It, it meets all of those performance standards, you know, things like impervious coverage, for example, building setbacks, number of parking spaces. In fact, this, this project here in this particular property would accommodate by right in the zoning uh, up to 60% of impervious surface. The project as is currently proposed, I believe, is approximately 36% impervious coverage here, which does, as I mentioned, reflect uh, a total number of parking spaces that's consistent with with the underlying zoning requirements. The project proposes a single full access driveway, which you can see at the bottom of the screen and thereabouts where my, my cursor is, to uh, Route 5 and 10. Um, that driveway has received approval from the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. So they, they have granted us access rights to the road. That driveway is now, now permitted. Um, through, through the discussions with the board, and as was mentioned by Attorney Costa at the beginning of this discussion, there was a number of things that the board had asked and it was reached as part of that settlement agreement for inclusion with this plan. And I'll talk about them individually, but just as a brief summary, um, they were included a additional pedestrian and bicycle, connect, bicycle connection out to Mill Village Road, which is identified by this, this gray uh, stripe on, on the plan here. It also included the shifting of the driveway further to the north than the originally permitted driveway, which you can see on this plan here. The original permit location was this, this gray here that's just to the left on this image. Um, it also included the upgrades to the architecture of the building, which I'll go through after I get through some of the site plan components here. 
and it also included the depiction of where the proposed private heating fuel supply, the propane tank would be, which is this black oval in the upper right corner of the plan. And I can go through that in a bit, a bit more detail. So this facility, um, as we had talked about previously and you know, some year and a half or so ago, is proposed to be open. Um, hours of operation are from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week. It includes uh, generally the, the product that's, that's sold here, you know, it's consistent with the definition of retail sales. It's a mix of general retail goods in, inside here. It may have limited food product, limited retail components and dry goods and, and things of that nature. Um, the, the utility infrastructure that we're proposing to accommodate this product, the, the water and electric and telecom services are going to be provided by way of the existing infrastructure that's located in Mill Village Road. The sanitary sewer disposal system will be by way of a previously approved subsurface wastewater disposal system. And as I've mentioned, the heating supply will be by a, by a private propane service. In terms of uh, landscaping and screening, uh, there was much discussion with the board and with the town's uh, independent peer review consultants about screening. As you can see on this rendering, there is a number of new and additional plantings that are proposed for this project. Of particular focus during our initial discussions was this, this boundary here, which is the northern property boundary. And, and as it abuts that uh, residential area in the condominium development, there's a number of different plantings that have been incorporated in there to create a dense vegetated buffer along that boundary. Similarly, and as was requested by the board previously, we incorporated a similar theme along the Mill Village Road boundary and immediately opposite of, of Plain Road and in the property on that side there. Uh, similarly to that, we've also incorporated a number of different coniferous plantings uh, at the front of the property, which provides some additional screening for, for the left portion of the parking lot, which you see here, and then ground cover and, and additional plantings along the portion of the parking spaces, which face five and 10, to attenuate potential uh, headlights, which may be witnessed at the road during, during evening operating hours. In terms of stormwater, the, the project is you, this, this light green hatch that I'm, I'm circling with my cursor, that is the proposed detention and infiltration basin, which is going to accommodate, attenuate, and treat runoff that's associated with both the paved surfaces of the facility as well as the rooftop. It, water is directed uh, there through a surface, uh, either surface conveyance or a closed drainage network that enters a sediment forebay and then is allowed to slowly matriculate into the basin itself. The, the project as a whole, and in particular the stormwater, was very thoroughly reviewed by the town's independent peer review consultant. The town had retained tie and bond to review the site design as well as the stormwater design. And through a number of different reviews on their behalf, they ultimately provided comment. And we, we the applicant, addressed those comments and they issued a letter acknowledging that their comments had, had been addressed to, to satisfaction. Of that included review of the stormwater system, in particular its, its function and design and compliance with both the, the local stormwater ordinance as well as that which is employed by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Um, with respect to that basin, there's a particular focus on the grading design and the hydrology or the hydraulics of that basin. And as was documented in Tyne Bond's review and as the, the drainage report and the calculations that have been submitted to this board, it, it met those standards, including uh, separation to groundwater, both in terms of the, the test pits and the field observations that were conducted to, to verify the estimated seasonal high groundwater elevations and how the basin achieved the requisite separations from, from that um, estimated seasonal high groundwater elevation. And as I'd mentioned, Time Bond concurred through multiple review sessions and discussions with them with those findings. With respect to the lighting, the lighting is proposed through a combination of different, different lights here, and I'll zoom in just a little bit. So as, as this graphic illustrates, there are three pole mounted lights in the parking lot, which my cursor is, is circling. Hopefully everybody can at least pick those up generally in the plan. There are some overhead lights that are attached to the building, some wall packs in the front. And then there are 
a handful of lights. I believe there's three on this side of the building, which is the right side of the image, and two on the left side of the image. Now, the lighting that we're proposing is shielded and cut off. It's directed to be uh, thrown in interior to the property so that it, it provides adequate illumination of parking areas, pedestrian corridors, and building entrances. It is LED lighting that is being proposed here too. It's energy efficient and allows us to further control direction and illumination levels on the ground. Uh, the lighting stays on for approximately 30 minutes after the facility has closed to allow employees to finish up interior to the building, get in their vehicle and leave. Um, lights, the, there will be lights that stay on above each of the either access or egress points. Those lights are downward throw and create, and create just a small, very small halo on on the sidewalk area around the perimeter of the building to provide security level illumination or illumination of egress points uh, overnight. The remainder of the site lighting goes off during, during those evening hours. In terms of um, deliveries, the facility is expected or anticipated to receive one primary delivery a week. That delivery is received in the loading portion of the building which is located in the upper right corner of this image. And those two doors are to allow for that product to be delivered into the facility. Uh, that's kind of the, the really quick and, and high altitude overview of the improvements. I, I'd be happy to go through anything on the site before I get into some of the architecture. I just wanted to give a brief pause. I, I did cover a lot in a fairly quick manner. So if there were any questions on that point before I transitioned, I'd, I'd be happy to answer anything. <clears throat> I think it's appropriate to continue. Um, anybody else? Uh, Annalie, no? Oh, that's fine. Uh, and Mary? I can't see you, so. Nope, I'm good. Thank you. Max, you're good too? Yeah. Okay, so with the vice chair's permission, I'll continue through the architecture discussion. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So with respect to architecture, is as, as everybody can imagine, this was of uh, particular focus and we spent a, a, a number of hours talking about appearance of the building and, and how that wanted to look. It, it evolved greatly and frankly for the better uh, through, through those discussions and there was some passionate discussion about the appearance of the building. So what ultimately resulted from those discussions was what you see before you and one inclusion on the Mill Village side, which I'll touch, touch upon in a second, but generally speaking, what what this building is trying to achieve is giving it that, that rural and, and barn style feel, including with the color, the materials, and the various elements that have been incorporated into it. So the, the front of the building is in this upper left corner here. This is the, the view that would be facing out towards Route 5 and 10. That side has got the, the clapboard siding. It's got a cedar style shake product on the, on the peak element that's above the entrance. It has a, can a shingled canopy, a porch style canopy on the front of the building, which, which flanks the, the main entrance. It's got a, a, a peaked roof element in the beginning with shed style dormers. And also on the front, it creates or it includes these, these shuttered style windows that are, have the barn side feel. Now, this, the, as you proceed onto the right side of the image, the, the right side elevation, which is the side that's, that's loading, this thing carries that theme through. So you can see again, the peaked side or peaked roof element carries the clapboard siding down and then has that, that porch style element that, that extends out beyond the entrance. The elevation in the lower left corner, this is the side of the building that is, is most proximate to Mill Village Road. Um, the additions through to discussions with the planning board, the, the window element that's incorporated along the front of the building was also incorporated along this side of the building as well. So you can see that there are three barn style or shuttered windows on that side of the building. Those were included at the direct request of the planning board through the discussions that were brokered by attorney Costa and attorney Donahue. And then lastly, in the lower left corner of the image, that's, that's the rear of the building. And you can see that the the peak style roof element is seen kind of, that would be interior to the page and not all the way carried through the rear of the building. And then it has the, the vertical siding element uh, along the back to kind of the, the barn style to incorporate that. And then the coloration of it was, was specifically selected through discussions with the board to have it that kind of rustic red or that, that barn style uh, coloration. 
Any questions thus far? Sounds good. Okay, I don't know that I have much more to get into specifically, um, or at least in that initial discussion, if there were questions, thoughts, I'd be happy to answer those before we um, turn it over to Mr. Kelly to talk about some of the traffic improvements. Go ahead, Annalie, yes, please. Yeah, I don't know if this is the time for this. Um, with the, the plan that you have in front, I'm wondering whether or not now or later in your presentation, you can address signage. And then also in regards to the parking, um, <clears throat> I know there's been some variation in the number of parking places, and I'm wondering what the <clears throat> traffic pattern is for the truck deliveries, most particularly if the trucks need to turn around, how that will be right, right, accomplished. Right. Certainly, and, and if you don't mind, um, Vice Chair, I'm happy to answer those directly. I just didn't want to be presumptuous to think that was okay, but. No, it's fine, yeah. Okay, thank you. So with, with respect to signage, uh, the, the product is, is considering or proposes a, a ground mounted sign, which is generally where I'm circling on the cursor. The, the specific design of that sign is, is not yet finalized, but the intent is that that sign is, is consistent with the dimensional requirements, look and feel and, and size that would be regulated by the town's signage requirements for that. And it's, it's proposed in, you know, interior to the property and it's almost 100 feet away from, from the road. So it's gonna be kind of up and in the front where we have landscaping around the, the bottom of it. Um, with respect to the parking, can in you, very you, initial application, proposed a bit uh, more less. I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, just a little bit more. So it's ground mounted. It's not. It's just. Uh, it's not interior lit. You've, you've been through the signage. We have our signage. You might want to just address that now. Sure. The well, well, the, the, the I I can touch base with regard to the signage. It's it's we're we're aware of what the bylaw. Uh, requires for signage and uh, the, the intent uh, and the plan right now is that sign will be designed to comport to the bylaw. Okay. But it hasn't been designed. Okay. And there is no signage on the building itself? There, there will be signage on the building. There's going to be a, a tenant identifying sign located above the front door, which again, the intent is that it's consistent with the town's requirements for signage. Thank you. So with respect to the question regarding parking, uh, the uh, very, very original application had contemplated um, a handful of spaces fewer than what is shown here. And, and predominantly, it was the elimination of, of these spaces located on the right side of the building. Uh, from an operational perspective, th this particular facility at, at peak most parking may, may utilize slightly less than half of the number of parking spaces that are, that are shown here through a number of different discussions with the planning board, it, it was determined that the board's preference at the time was for this project to provide the minimum number of spaces that is required under the zoning ordinance, which, which this project did through that review process. So the, the applicant and the, the project proposes some parking, which is consistent with the underlying dimensional requirements for the property. Now, your, your question about loading, when a loading vehicle would, would arrive at the property, the anticipated movement would be for that vehicle to, to turn left quickly into the front, maneuver itself into position so that the, the trailer was located against the rear of the, of the building, where it would then be easily loaded in or out of the facility, and then it would immediately pull straight out and make a right or left turn onto Route 5 and 10. When, when we review maneuvering, we, we do that. that that's, that's part of what we would be doing with, with MassDOT, as well as our own internal design to make sure that that vehicle can sufficiently maneuver interior to the property without having any interfacing or impact to, to available parking spaces on the property so that they're not commingling, so to speak. Thank you. So I understand you're going to move on to traffic. Is that the next next hit? Yep, provided there are no further discussion on the site. Uh, no, actually, I do have a question. This Thanks. is Denise. Yeah, um, yeah I, I had a couple of questions. First of all, with the color of the building, is that an accurate depiction, what I see on screen? Because I know working with graphic designers, sometimes it doesn't show the same in real life. I think it, you'll, you'll find it'll be, it'll be very, very similar. We try to, to the extent that you can mimic the color of the product, you know, digitally, 
there, there may be some slight variation, but for all intents and purposes, this is going to be very, very similar to the color of the product that you'd experience in the field. So similar. I said, why don't we, I, 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 pardon me, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, the, uh, the building designer is uh, on the line and with your permission. Mm -hmm. um, well, now, okay, so what I'm seeing now, could it be brighter than that or could it be darker than that? Doug, perhaps okay. you can weigh in. Yes, if I may. Uh, for the record, my name is Doug Brewer. I'm with BKA Architects. We're the architect of record for the project. Uh, when we created these renderings, we did our best to do a color match. Um, and it's represented accurately on the CAD when I printed these. It might be a little bit brighter in reality um, than it's actually shown here. And it's actually also being darkened here too by the, um, the horizontal lines of the clapboard. So it, it, it's close, but like Austin said, when you, you know, reproduce uh, you know, digitally, uh, you know, it's going to be some color variations. Okay. Is it um, a color that you've used on previous uh, projects with other yes. journals? Yes. Okay. So and, we can see a photo of it in another, uh, that would be, have its yeah. own, you know, distortions, but at least would give us a sense for that. That might be mm -hmm. a good thing to add to it. And I, okay. I do have one other question, and the question's about the lighting. You know, it's, I mean, I've looked at the, at the plans, but it's sort of hard to, to see. And I, where, where is the lighting actually going to be? You said down, downlit, and at what height is that going to be? The, the height has some variation. There's, as it mentioned, there. No, I'm talking about the lighting in the back of the building that you said that would be on at night. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so there's, there's wall mounted lighting right. on the side. So the, the wall mounted lighting uh, on the front, I believe is approximately 18 feet high. Mm -hmm. And then there's some wall packs on the side, which are approximately 12 feet high. So ma majority of those lights are going to go off approximately 30 minutes after the store is closed for, for public access. One light will remain on on the front, which is it faces exactly down. So the, the light will create a small circular halo above the front, the front door. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, the, the wall pack, the light that would be downward facing above the door on the left and the right would be on uh, overnight too. And again, creates a small illuminated halo on the concrete apron around the outside of the building as well, just for security purposes. The remainder mm -hmm. of the site lighting would go off approximately 30 minutes after the store has been closed. Okay, the ones that are staying on overnight, you said at, are at a, at a 12 foot level? The, the two on the side of the building are at 12 feet. The one on the front is approximately okay. 18 feet. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Austin, I know this is in your purview. The the can you talk just a little bit more about the drainage on the 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 side toward? We we talked quite a bit about that at the time. Um, that this this portion. I don't know if you see my cursor, but uh, this portion um, to the north, and how that just how that's working out. That was a a big concern. It was a concern of mine. And I, I'm not questioning, I'm just asking for clarification so I give you the answer you're looking for. You're referring um, to off-site drainage that is in, yes, in the right of way? Drainage, um, and the septic that is, that, uh, that the, how it interfaces with septic on the properties that are opposite the undeveloped property that is there. Right. Okay, understood. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. So as I, as I mentioned briefly, with respect to stormwater and, and gen the generally how the topography of this property lays out, the, the rear of the property is generally higher. And, and generally speaking, water flows from the, the top of this page yeah. to, the, to the front of the page. And similarly, the abutting condominium development in this, in this field area here are, are generally higher. They, they flow down in, in the direction of Route 5 and 10, where ultimately it enters the closed drainage network. How how this particular basin is working, it's, it is down gradient of, of the, the residential properties and, and, and some of the infrastructure that might be located on that property. And in, in larger storm events, this pond is designed with, you know, to attenuate and control peak flow. So it's gonna hold water back for those, for those events, allow it to infiltrate into the ground slowly. And ultimately in some of the higher, higher storms, it would have a slow and controlled release which would mimic the existing hydrology, it would direct that into the drainage channels that exist in the state right of way, which would ultimately and slowly make its way to that catch basin as it happens in the existing condition. As it interfaces with the septic systems to the best that we know right now, 
this basin is, is down gradient of those. So it's not that it's going to send water or it's not designed to send water back to those systems where it might introduce water where it would, wouldn't otherwise be expected. So the, this, um, that property it to the kind of, oh, oh, right. say is like North, um, if the, yeah. D, the DOT property, that's part of the, pro, that's part of the program. You're counting on that as a part of uh, the, the water ecosystem that's natural. Uh, yeah. I don't know that I'm, I wouldn't say I'm relying on it. What we're using is the natural topography of the property as you normally would. I'm not altering anything in the state right of way that wouldn't be required for the driveway. I'm not changing the hydrology of it. I'm not grading in there that wouldn't be otherwise required for to, to create the access driveway that DOT approved. We're relying on the natural topography and gravity, but beyond that, we're not intending to you know, rely on it to help us attenuate stormwater. It's simply that water goes downhill and that's the direction that it flows. Hmm. What is the relative elevation to the south side of the property and the north side of the property? So I will, south I will, north. I will bring up the grading plan. So this is the, the grading plan. The road is down at elevation about 222 plus or minus. The, the north side of the property is around elevation 229. And as you can see, as you continue to climb up that where these residences are around 230. So there's about an eight to nine foot difference in grade change from route five and 10 to the rear of our property. Right. Uh, that, so that's east to west, uh, west to east, but south to oh, north, north to south or south to north um, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so there's kind of a, a break in here that this left edge or I'm sorry, right <laughs> edge of the property is down about elevation 223. And then on the, on the far side, as you're closer to Mill Village, the, the, the elevation that we're put about elevation 228. Now that water gets divided and gets ultimately sent to the basin and then that basin drains out through the low spot and the drainage channel that exists in the state right of way. Right. So, so the, the, that property, the state right of way property is actually part of the drainage, drainage plan <clears throat> because as you point out, it is a, uh, it's gravity fed. So it, it would be no matter what, it's just now that there's more impervious surface there. Well, it's, it's, it's part of the drainage plan, like I mentioned, in the fact that water does go downhill. So ultimately water is going to flow through that natural conveyance channel. But like mm -hmm. I said, we're not relying on it in terms of attenuation treatment or anything like that. It's just, it's ultimately going to go where it goes today, which is through that, that drainage channel. Right. But it does, so I guess, my point is, with the, the greater surface area, because of the larger size of the project, uh, it, there's just a greater movement of water that northerly direction to the northwestern, northeastern portion of the prod. The, and you have the attenuation, the, the retention pot uh, there, but it's still going to, you're still counting on the DOT property to, be, to do its natural thing. I mean, that is part of the plan. Yeah, well, yes, and I, I'm, I'm, I apologize for creating too fine of a distinction here. It's part of the plan in the extent that that's where water goes. It's not part of the plan that we're not proposing to create that low spot. If that no, I get it. I get it. You're okay. not right. it happen. It's happening. It's just that because of the impervious surface, it is a that, that's our that's our issue now, right? That's that's the issue that that more water is going to go that direction, and so we that's why you have the. The, the plan on site, but also the off site water is, you don't have any plan over that, about that. That's just where it's gonna go. Correct, and that's, that's, what, that's what DOT, when they review this, you know, part, part of their review is to look at hydraulics and hydrology of, of their driveway and the drainage conditions. So one of, the, one of the comments that we were working through with them was making sure that the culvert was appropriately sized and, and designed to accommodate this particular driveway. So that, that was part of their approval. Right, because I mean, we, we're, we're in the business of, uh, spending a good bit of money in this town on culverts um, that have been stressed because of our water levels in this town. Currently, you know, we're in a little dry spot, so we're not seeing the same stress on them, but they have been very stressed over the last decade. And so that, that culvert is of concern. Um, so it's just, that's an issue. But that was what we brought up before, so yeah. Good. Understood. Yeah. I, I have another question uh, yeah. pertaining to that. I think, it's my understanding, and I've you know, I've driven by when it's rained a lot. It's my understanding that there's a lot of flooding to the north for the dinosaur place, and I'm wondering how is this culvert? Is I mean, ever since the trees were clear cut, 
there, you know, there's nothing to absorb the water. So I think they're experiencing some flooding. So how is this uh, drainage going to mitigate that? I mean, it's, I mean, it, is there still going to be flooding or is that this supposed to take care of that problem? Well, I mean, the, 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 on, the on-site improvements are designed, you know, Per, per local and, and DEP standards to, to attenuate. So what we're tasked with doing there is providing design calculations that, that document how the basin is going to function and that it can reduce the, the post-development calculated rates of runoff from the pre-development. So we have to analyze both the hydrology of the existing condition and then analyze the hydrology of the post-development condition, compare those two and document that this project is designed to reduce the peak rates of runoff in the post-development condition. So th this product achieves that. Now with, with respect to the drainage that's in the right of ways, you, you can see here and I'll, there is a drainage swell that DOT created that runs along the frontage of routes five and 10. That's really intended to create or collect that sheet flow that comes off the roadway. Mm -hmm. That drains through this culvert and then goes and continues on into the existing catch basin that's located on the right side and where my cursor is. That drainage pattern is intended to be maintained here. And, and to answer your question about the flooding, you may see in high frequency storm events or high intensity storm events, water that's draining through this channel, which is the intent of that channel. Ultimately, it goes into that catch basin and then into the state's closed drainage network. So you may see and continue to see water in that channel, but it's doing what it's designed to do. As part of our review with DOT, which was quite lengthy, they had us looking at that culvert specifically and asked us to you know, locate it in a very specific location and to be a very specific size. That was part of their review process. Mm -hmm. so, Wait, I'm sorry, so, the culvert, you're not putting in the culvert. What are you saying? The, no. the, the, there is an existing culvert that goes underneath, like if you, if you look, let's see, so right. just to bring up the aerial again. This, this driveway that was created once upon a time ago, there is a culvert under that driveway today. DOT, as part of their review, had us mimic the hydrology of that culvert and actually, in fact, asked us to upgrade the size of that culvert where it's an eight inch culvert today. They're asking us to upgrade it to a 12 inch culvert and maintain its flow path along the ditch that is, exists. So well, that's part of their project, obviously not presenting here tonight, but that is part of the project that does impact the the water flow in the area for us. It, it, it improves that condition that was DOT asking us to upsize the culvert. So it's part of their jurisdiction and their review of the improvements that are in their right of way. They asked us to look at that specifically. And then and frankly, and then issued their approval based on that feedback and our agreement to do that. Well, doesn't, doesn't that culvert um, uh, flow into the Bloody Brook ultimately? Yes. And that where we've had a lot of flooding issues before. So, yeah. In, increasing the size of the culvert to me sounds like it's going to increase the flow of the water, especially if we have a really hard rain. Does, does that make sense or not? It's not to increase uh, the flow of water, it's to meet the, inc the increased flow. To meet of the water. increase. But it, well, it's hardly an increased flow of water. That's what we mm -hmm. see. We've been seeing there prior to any development, we've been seeing that that area without those trees is not <laughs> managing, like naturally not managing right. the water the way it did before. Well, we can see tomorrow, we're supposed to get one to two inches of rain tomorrow. <laughs> I think to, to answer your question about the size of the culvert, though, I, what, what that you're seeing is DOT's acknowledgement that the existing culvert that was in place, that eight inch culvert, you know, through over the years may have become deficient in terms of size. And accordingly, they saw this as an opportunity to upgrade that deficiency and ask mm -hmm. the applicant to do it. Now, your, your question about where does it go? that culvert ultimately conveys the, or it provides a conduit for the service runoff in the ditch to go to the existing catch basin, which is located generally where my cursor is here. Ultimately, that pipe network conveys water to the Bloody Brook, which is substantially further downstream from this particular project. It's not directly, the culvert is not directly connected, however. Is it reasonable to expect that since there is so much impervious surface that there in fact will be more water in the culvert? I, I don't think that's a, a reasonable expectation. I think um, the project, as I mentioned, the stormwater controls on the property are designed to attenuate the stormwater flows from the project. If, if I had no stormwater controls, I would suggest that might be a fair statement. In this case, I, I don't think that that's um, going to be the case. I don't anticipate that to be the case. Well, and and, and just, just one clarification. When you say reduce, can you quantify that? 
Yeah, we, we, we provided a drainage report that was, that was um, thoroughly reviewed by the town's peer review consultant mm -hmm. that provided all the calculations and the, the supporting documentation for our drainage design. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Were there questions for Austin before we uh, shift our focus to traffic? Not at the moment, thanks. Max, are you good? Man, Mary? For now? All right, let's keep going. Thank you, Austin. So, Sean, Madam Chair, the, 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 there's been a lot of discussion about traffic, and I'm going to have Mr. Kelly um, not go backwards uh, because traffic was reviewed by this board previously, and it was peer reviewed uh, previously, um, and we're really not in a position to go back and rehash that necessarily. But I do want him to review with you specifically uh the nature of the improvements in and around the area that were part of the settlement discussions uh i think that's what's relevant uh to you in your criteria i draw your attention to section 5462 of the bylaw where in which the criteria is not general traffic rather it's whether the project needs to, is done in a fashion to maximize pedestrian and vehicular safety both on the site and egressing from it so that's the limited focus of the traffic analysis. So with that, uh, I'd introduce to um, the new board members, uh, Sean Kelly of Vanessa Associates. Sean. Uh, thank, thank you, Mark. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Again, Sean Kelly with Vanessa. Um, on behalf of the project team, thank you for having us before you tonight. Uh, since we last met with the board, we've been in discussions with, with Mass DOT uh, relative to um, expanding the, the proposed uh, mitigation plan uh, for the project. Um, specifically, for those that were on the board, you may recall the last time we met with you, we, we had discussed at length um, a road safety audit that was done by the state for the intersection of routes five and 10 with uh, Mill Village Road in the North Main Street. And the road safety audit essentially is a, it's a, it's a collaborative study that's done with uh, representatives from the town, representatives from the state. Typically, you have your, your fire department, police department, uh, DPW engineering, MassDOT sends people from the safety division from the District 2 office in Northampton. And what they do is they look at the safety concerns at this location and they make a list of recommendations of things that could be done to, to improve safety. Um, regrettably, that report you know, was done a number of years ago and, and none of these measures uh, have been implemented at this time, either through a lack of funding or a uh, lack of initiative. Um, if it's possible, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, that would be fine. Uh, do you, does the aerial show up right now? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Easy. Okay, great. So this is um, this is the intersection that you get. Here's the project site. We're located in the, uh, the northwest quadrant, Route 5 and 10, northbound uh, and southbound. Um, some of the recommendations that were outlined were, you know, there's a lack of, of turning lanes at this location. There are some, you know, not, I wouldn't call them heavy volumes, but there are a number of turning movements onto uh, both North Main and Mill Village. And as you can see under existing conditions, there's no uh, left turn lane that allows a car to bypass. It also can create confusion for approaching traffic when they don't understand whether someone is turning or going straight. Um, a lot of the pavement markings out here, as you can see, are worn away. There's the stop bars that are on the side street approaches are, are all but non-existent. Um, you may be aware that there was a, there was a recent crash out here where a, a driver was coming down Mill Village Road. Um, pull too far out into the street and, and a motorcyclist coming southbound actually struck that vehicle. Um, and again, you know, not saying it was necessarily the cause, but there, today the pavement markings are lacking. Um, there's nowhere to delineate where you should, you know, stop when you come to these approaches. Um, bicycle accommodations to the south of this location are, are, are adequate. You know, they're, they're exclusive bike lanes traveling south. But you can see on the aerial here, there are, there are areas where the, the shoulder lane gets down to, you know, one foot, maybe four feet. Um, and unfortunately, you know, if you're a bicyclist, you know, you have a shoulder for a certain distance and now you're forced to travel um, in the travel lane with, with vehicular traffic where there's no, um, you know, safe area for you to, to drive. Um, if you've ever been in this intersection at night, you'll notice that it's, it's very dark. Um, there's no street lighting. It's, it's, it's essentially a pitch black location. Um, it's, you know, there's, there's no illumination whatsoever. Um, so what we've done is we've been working with MassDOT for a number of months now. Um, are, you, are you seeing the plan now? Just to make sure that. Not yet. We're still on the um, aerial view of the site. 
Uh, let me see if I can, um, if I can pull this up. You have the plan now? Not yet. Please, I'm like, there we go, good. Okay. So this is the plan that we've been working um, on with MassDOT, just to orient ourselves. It's a, I've got it going the same way. Here's Mill Village, here's Maine, five and 10, the project site is in this area. Here's the proposed driveway. Um, some of the changes that we've incorporated, you know, Austin already touched on, we've, we've shifted the site driveway a little further from the intersection, which was a, a request of the board and something that MassDOT agreed was a good idea. Uh, we've also provided the pedestrian connection to Mill Village Road that's not shown. Um, and with respect to the RSA recommendations, um, I think that one of the biggest improvements is we've, as you can see, we've restriped the corridor so that as you're coming northbound now, uh, we provide an exclusive left turn lane. So cars that want to turn the Mill Village Road have an area to stack and store, and it doesn't impede through vehicles that are continuing northbound on the corridor. Similarly, in the southbound direction, you know, there'll be a left turn lane that gets you onto North Main Street which piggybacks into a, a left turn lane into the site. So whether you're turning into the site as a, as a customer, turning on the North Main, those movements can occur, again, while not um, impeding through traffic on the corridor. In all the areas within the limits of our work, um, where there was insufficient shoulder width to accommodate bike traffic, we're recommending you know, widening. That will provide a minimum five foot shoulder, uh, which provides sufficient width to accommodate bicyclist traffic in a safe manner. Uh, that's a measure that doesn't exist today. So now there's, there'll be a complete connection from the bike lanes to the south through the intersection and then carrying on to the, to the north where there are shoulders available um, along both sides of the corridor. Um, as you can see, there are a number of notes. So most of these notes here are signs. Um, mo many of the signs that are out there are either faded and worn away or they currently um, don't meet the, the current standards as defined by the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD. So any location where it was recommended or we noted a sign that wasn't up to current code, we're recommending that those get removed. Um, the stop bars, again, coming on the side streets, we're proposing to restripe these so that it's, it's clear if you're coming on the side street where you stop and don't create issues with the oncoming traffic, whether it be uh, bicyclists or vehicular. Um, and then again, the issue in terms of the, um, the, the illumination at night, we're proposing an overhead street light um, at this intersection, which I think will certainly create a more safe environment for motorists um, during evening hours. Um, and that, that in a nutshell is, is you know, what we're looking at. We have um, provided this to MassDOT, and if this pulls up, you can see we've, we have been issued a permit. Um, they reviewed the work. Um, they're in agreement that it, you know, the, the improvements make sense, and, and they've signed off on these improvements as well as the site access plan on the five and 10. Uh, that's really all I have for tonight. Uh, again, I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have relative to these to this improvement plan. Does this improvement plan um, include a widening of the road? Uh, what kind of improvement? Because we actually have recently talked to DOT. We were at a we had a, a town meeting to talk about from this point down, um, and we th these kinds of improvements had never. This is all, you know, obviously negotiated by you and them, but does it include a large a broadening of the road for bicycle? Um, the, there's, the widening isn't, I wouldn't call it expansive. It's probably in the order of five feet or less. Some areas it may only be one or two feet. Um, it's primarily along our frontage and areas where the, the shoulder width today doesn't accommodate bicycles in a safe manner. Um, we have reviewed it with DOT. They, they did sign off on it, um, but it's not, not it's no, it's not expansive widening and all the widening that's being done is, is within the state right away. So it's not involving any private land. Gotcha. So would that impact the foliage and the drainage discussion? The fact that you're widening it between two and five feet in some areas? Yeah, I don't, um, Oh, it's additional impervious cover that will end up into the, the drainage system that's in the street right away. Correct. Could you say that in a different way? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it, it, it's fair to assume that the creation of an additional impervious cover has the impact of creating additional runoff. That runoff will be directed by gravity to the uh, state, the, the currently existing drainage system that's maintained in the state right of way. 
it won't impact in any fashion the project within your jurisdiction. Okay. In relation to the wetlands and the stormwater runoff to where those two to five feet it's, is? It's, with, it's within the state right of way. It's not part of the site plan. We still have to deal with the water? <laughs> right. No, I mean, his point, the, the attorney's point is that this is a big project, um, a bigger project. The road, the road work is a bigger project. It, it goes beyond the purview of this board to assess whether DOT is doing what they're supposed to do or not. We can respond to it, but we can't, we're not in charge of them. Madam Vice Chair. Yes. Um, so I, I, I've stayed quiet and, and I'm happy to continue to do so, but I, I wanted to just raise a point that Attorney Donahue hasn't and that uh, the members may not recall or may not have been aware, but in, in settlement discussions, specifically in the settlement meeting that I had referenced in my introductory remarks back in October of last year, um, there were a number of issues raised by the planning board representatives uh, and by the representative of the select board and by the acting town administrator at the time concerning possible uh, modifications of the roadway, whether it be bike lanes or restriping or widening or sidewalks or whatever the topic might have been. Mm -hmm. And as expected and consistent with the applicant's representations tonight, the applicant indicated that it was um, at the mercy of MassDOT that it doesn't control, nor does the town control the roadway. Um, with that being said, and this is what board members may not know or may not recall, there was ongoing communication that occurred, that was occurring at that time between the district permit engineer for District 2 at Mass DOT, Highway Department, um, and uh, Diana Schindler, your, your former town administrator. And I have an email chain here that I know the chair of your board was aware of because he was copied on it. And obviously he's not present tonight, um, but it was an email that uh, was sent to Diana by um, the, the permit engineer for District 2, um, indicating that they had been asked to process a, an access permit request for a commercial driveway for this site. And that prior to permitting, they wanted to make sure, and I'm reading verbatim, they wanted to make sure that they considered whatever types of things the town might be requiring of the developer. Mm -hmm. So uh, Diana responded, and I recall the, the response because she asked me to review it before it was sent, um, but she crafted it based upon discussions that were had at that settlement meeting. And she responded by indicating that there was ongoing litigation, that there were settlement discussions that had occurred, uh, and that certainly there was some discussion of the roadway as part of those settlement talks. Um, and she identified one, two, three, four bulleted items in a, an email dated um, November 22nd to MassDOT that were of concern or of interest to the town based upon the discussions that were occurring among staff, uh, discussions that occurred in, in the settlement talk. So I'd like to read those just so the board knows what was communicated to MassDOT because I think it's of some interest. Again, not saying that MassDOT is going to do any of these things or what consideration they're going to give, but just that they have been communicated by the town. So the first statement was that the, bike, that the town supports bike lanes, right. sidewalks, and any crossings proposed by DOT on any DOT controlled ways to encourage complete streets efforts so long as they promote and are consistent with public safety. Uh, the town adopted a robust complete streets policy last year and is heavily invested in town-wide planning for implementation. Again, I'm just reading directly from the email. Uh, item, item two or bulleted point number two, because Mill Village Road is the Franklin County Bikeway and to, to further support the complete streets efforts, the town has requested a four foot bike path that has been added from the front of the building to Mill Village Road. A bike rack has also been added at the, uh, at the uh, southeast corner of the building to accommodate bike traffic. The bike path is subject to DOT approval since a portion of it is located within the DOT right of way. Item three, the town has requested the restriping of a stretch of five and 10 to accommodate a left turn lane into the site, which the developer had shown in revised plans subject to DOT approval. Town officials and constituents are the best barometer for the safety of the Mill Village Road and five and 10 intersection. 
In our direct experience, it is a very busy, confusing intersection where higher and lower speed traffic and two, wave, uh, two ways of traffic cross and converge. A left turn lane would create order where none currently exists. And then item four, the town requested the driveway to be relocated 57.5 feet to the north to create additional separation from the intersection of five and 10 and Mill Village Road, and also to better accommodate potential queuing with the above referenced left turn lane. As part of this request, we request that DOT ensure the drainage slash culvert infrastructure near the proposed driveway located within the DOT right of way is adequate and working. So again, I just wanted to recite that because it sounded like board members through their questions and maybe the applicant and its consultants through its responses were touching on some of these points. Again, not a complete resolution of these issues, but just for you to know that these issues were communicated to DOT uh, approximately uh, 11 months ago. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep, that's great. So th that's the pre presentation that we have, Madam Vice Chair. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, the board's previous decision indicated that the applicant had met its burden with regard to five of the nine criteria. Are they okay? Yes, spider. <laughs> okay. Sorry, just scared me. Call me off guard. No, it's, it's 2020. <laughs> it's probably a black widow. So. Uh, <laughs> so um, and I, I think what we've tried to address uh, through uh, the settlement discussions that Mr. Costa has reviewed with you in detail uh, and to summarize today are the changes that we made to try to be responsive to what we heard of the concerns on the other four uh, criteria. Uh, so we think we've met our burden uh, and we would um, respectfully ask the board to uh, do its part as part of the uh, discussion on the settlement and proceed to approve the site plan. Be glad Thank to answer you. any further questions you have. Thank you. At this point, we, we have um, public comment. Um, we have a moment here to uh, hear from our constituency, the people, the abutters, um, people who have concerns about the project. Um, and I think we open it up to the, those folks to um, express their concerns so that we're privy to what it is that is concerning our community. Um, and I know that Jen- um, Well, if, if I might, Madam Ch uh, Vice Chair, yes. I, I, you, you certainly can run the meeting any way you want. Um, yep. you know, we, we have attended uh, at this point, uh, inclusive of the previous uh, time, probably more than 30 hours of testimony on a 9,300 square foot building. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're, uh, it, it's your meeting, and I'm not telling you how to run it, but I would hope that there'd be some restriction that A, the issues relate to the site plan, mm -hmm. uh, matters that are within this board's jurisdiction, uh, and B, that there'd be some, uh, at least, uh, effort to try to restrict it uh, everyone who I'm sure has spoken today is, has already spoken probably at least twice during the ongoing ZBA hearing. Uh, and uh, I can certainly say for the applicants team, uh, we don't have any need to hear it again. Here, the problem is, of course, is that this is a, a separate plan. And I agree with you. I'll, we will try to hold the, the, the program close to the, the purview of what is um, in our view from a planning board point of view, the plan itself. Um, but I think that if we do not open it to the public, we, we will be turning away from a, a process that has supported our town I, for a long time. So I, 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 can, I can fully appreciate the desire to open it. Um, I would remind you that a public hearing doesn't mean that everyone has to get a right to speak. That's the decision ultimately of you, the chair. Uh, and so I hope you wouldn't feel necessary to address, uh, have each and every person who raises their hand be knowledge. We have 23 attendees. I don't know that we'll have time for everyone to speak, but I know that the, the attendees will be interested. Jen, Jennifer, do you have? Yes, Adam, uh, our uh, council has uh, his hand up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So I, I just want to, and again, I apologize for interrupting again, but I think it may be beneficial, particularly as we sort of embark on, on public comment. And I, um, I appreciate council's advice or, or, or comment about um, limiting the scope, certainly, of, of public comment. Um, obviously, a, a, a chief objective of this remand process, as I had alluded to before, and the concept of due process and, and good municipal governance is that we allow the public to, to sort of say their piece. 
so long as it's on topic. So I agree that it's appropriate to maybe limit the length of comments or the, the, the period of time we're gonna spend on public comment. I would certainly not recommend against eliminating public comment, but I prepared something that um, in my conversations with the town administrator and the assistant town administrator was requested of me. And I'm gonna attempt to share my screen momentarily here if I could, um, because I know that attorney Donahue has referred to this at least once. So there's nothing here that isn't a, a direct excerpt either from the zoning bylaw or from your decision in late 2018. And so I've, I've, I've broken it out into separate sort of paragraphs so it can be read very simply, but this is the standard verbatim from your zoning bylaw for the grant of site plan approval, what you need to determine and the factors you need to consider. And so we've got sort of this basic, uh, these basic statements up here that the planning board can impose reasonable conditions and uh, any new building or construction or site alteration shall provide adequate access for fire and service equipment and adequate provision for utilities and stormwater drainage. Um, new building construction shall be designed in the site plan after considering qualities of the specific location, uh, the proposed land use, design of building form, grading, egress points, etc. So as to, and then we've got the nine standards I had referenced at the beginning. And the reason that I've bolded some of them, which is my, my doing, and others like this one right here are not bolded, <clears throat> because the ones that aren't in bold, you'll see beneath them underlined, I've got the finding by the board back in December, and it's December 12, 2018. And that's because as Attorney Donahue has alluded to, you made findings, your board did, uh, understanding that the board was comprised of different members, that these standards were satisfied in some respect anyway. Um, this one is somewhat wishy-washy, um, not that that's a specific legal term, but it refers to the proposed plan attempting to minimize, but most of these others are pretty straightforward. For example, minimize visual intrusion by controlling the visibility of parking, storage, and service areas. The finding the board made back in 2018 was that the proposed plan does attempt to minimize visual intrusion by controlling the visibility of parking, storage, HVAC, and other service areas viewed from public ways. So I've gone through each of these and really the ones that are bolded and I haven't, I haven't put verbatim in here the finding you made, but suffice it to say, the finding you made was that these standards were not satisfied. And so these are the ones that you really got to focus in on tonight. Any of these are, are, are fair game, I think, for discussion by members of the public, because this is your purview. But number one, minimizing the volume of cut and fill, number of removed trees, length of removed stone walls, wetland vegetation displaced, stormwater flow increases, soil erosion, air and water pollution, that's a consideration. Maximizing pedestrian and vehicular safety, that's a consideration. And as we scroll down, two others, number seven, uh, minimizing unreasonable departure from the character and scale of building in the vicinity as viewed from public ways, that's a consideration. And lastly, number nine, compliance with the provisions of the zoning bylaw, including parking and landscaping, that's a consideration. So those are the four that were highlighted in the appeal filed by the applicant as findings you did not make or that you made in, in, in the negative that hadn't been satisfied. And that's really where your focus as a board after public comment is made should be. And so I, I don't know the extent I can put this back up on the screen later, but this is something again that I have been asked to prepare just so you can see in one place what the standard is and then where the findings need to be made and what the findings were previously in the 2018 decision. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to open uh, for public comment. Uh, we do have the Jen um, uh, monitoring us. Uh, she's our, our, oh, go ahead, Annalie. Please. Yeah. And I apologize for my confusion or my question on this, but it seems that we have had a site plan in 2018 and it, it seems to me now that there's been revisions to that site plan. And that makes me wonder if those previous conditions met. Well, first of all, is that correct? And secondly, does that impact the judgment made on how well the conditions have been met previously? 
So your question is, it have, has enough changed so that the whole thing needs to be reviewed? I don't know that the whole thing needs to be re reviewed, but I guess in terms of conclusions that were made based on an out-of-date site plan, is that, is that? See what you're saying. I think that enough of the site plan is it's substantively similar. Um, the, the changes that, that were presented tonight are the changes that they've made to a, a plan that is the same. These are the only changes that they've made. I don't believe that. I, th I think that's a fair question, Madam Vice Chair, through you. Um, and, and that's why I said that certainly public comment and, and frankly board deliberation can go to any of the standards that are within the bylaw, any of those nine criteria right. or findings that should be made in the, alter in, in the affirmative before granting site plan approval. Right. Um, I, I focus you on the four that were not deemed to be satisfied because obviously they weren't deemed to be satisfied. But if you were to look at the other five and determine that as a consequence of a change that has been made, right. that satisfied before is no longer satisfied, well, that would be a fair consideration. But having sat through the settlement meeting and having been directly involved in all the settlement talks, I don't think that the changes, and this is just my perspective, are wholesale enough. For example, you know, minimizing visual intrusion with respect to um, the visibility of parking, storage, outdoor service areas, you found before that that was met because parking, storage, HVAC units had been shielded, had been screened. Um, knowing what's changed about the plan, unless there was something that wasn't screened now because of the shifting of the roadway, the building is still in the same location. The architecture, the colors have changed a bit and there's some architectural detail, but the, the, the fencing that was proposed before and the screening and the landscaping is not changed substantially. So I would presume that if it was met before, it would continue to be met, but that's not, you know, that's my presumption, not, me, not, not my role to make that finding, that's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. That's great. Um, so Jen, would you like to, do we have hands up? I think. Yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. My screen blanked out for a second. Darren Gray, 20 Captain Lathrop Drive, South Deerfield, Massachusetts. Um, you're hearing me okay? We are hearing you just fine. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks everyone um, for all your good work tonight and leading up to this. I'll try to be brief. Um, let's see, under six, section 5431, section 5431A, applicants should show all topography, including septic. Um, the septic field is not shown on the drawings. I would recommend that you request for a coordinated plan set that shows that topography. The, the leach field is raising grade between two and a half and four feet behind the building. Uh, according to 5431D, sanitary sewage should be shown on the plans. Um, section 5431E, storm drainage, including means of ultimate disposal. Um, the engineer stated no grading in the right of way. That was very clear. I'm going to try and show my screen here. Let's see if I can Turn this around. Well, you could actually share. All right, well, so. Jennifer, can, Jen, can we give him um, share? Doesn't that make more sense? He, sh he should be able to do it by the. Well, anyways. I, Darren, you could just share your. I'm not on my computer with that. So. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, basically, what we got here, I don't know if you can see or not, if, if Austin has the uh, drawing number five, is the water comes out of the pond here comes out the pipe at 222.85 and it's all supposed to come down to this swale as he calls it down here and there's spot grades on the adjacent property is 222.24 on the right away the relief point is 221.34 it's not a lot of uh, elevation difference so I think the board if I was a neighbor to the north I'd want to have a hydrologic analysis done on that outfall area to make sure in the higher storm events that's not going to overtop onto the neighboring uh, neighboring property. Also under stormwater management standard number two, proponent must um, evaluate the impact of peak discharges for the 100 years 24 hour storm. If increased flooding, then best management practices should be 
which must be included. Um, they do increase peak flow on the 100 year storm, which is allowable, but I would definitely recommend that you ask for their evaluation of what the impacts are. Because um, basically what happened is the entire pond overtops at that point, it has a pipe, then an overflow weir, then you overtop the entire um, pond at the 100 year storm. So what's that impact? Where does that go? How do they see it happening? Like, I think some type of explanation is certainly warranted. Um, let's see, otherwise, for Mr. Kelly, who's a talented traffic engineer I worked with for years, actually, I would just ask if you could look at the uh, traffic islands on both Mill Village and North Main Street. They are asphalt on asphalt cover, colored. There's been um, overlays over the years. The, the curbing is really a small reveal. They're really hard to see. I think their orientation and geometry is really poor. I, th I personally think that's a big problem with what just, what, uh, the dangerous nature of that intersection. It's hard to tell where you're supposed to turn. Um, so I think those islands are a major part of it. I'd like it if he, I would recommend the board ask him to evaluate that. I think rebuilding those islands can go a long way towards helping that intersection. Uh, can and I yeah. just ask you quick, Darren, you're talking about, sorry, the Mill Village Island and what was the other? Um, North Main and Mill Village. So the oh, North is Main on both ways. Right. Well, I believe those are in the state highway right of way, but I'm not 100% on that. But I believe they're in the right of way. But their location, their orientation, their geometry, and certainly their condition and coloring, that you lose them completely in the pavement. It's really hard to see. I drive that road all the time, and it's, I find it confusing after 20 years of driving it. Um, I, I think it's something of a moot point, this last one. But I do want to point out that the site is increasing volume of water leaving the site. The volumetric flows are mitigated for the two and 10 year storms, but I just went through the drainage report and the two year storm is an 82% increase in volume leaving the site. 10 years to 45%, 25 years to 35%. And the 100 year storm, there is a 91% increase in overall volume, not volumetric flow rates, but overall volume of water. Right. So when they build their ponds, they stretch that time that, that water leaves the site, but there is a good deal more water coming off that site for sure. So again, I come back to the 100 year explaining the impacts of any flooding, how that's being mitigated, what we can expect from it. I think it's an important point. With that, I will say thank you everyone and uh, I'm done. Thank you, Darren. Appreciate your expertise loaned to the town. Um, Jennifer, anybody else? Yeah, I have a, I'll just do a question that's in the Q&A. Um, okay. Previous illustrations of the plan showed a privacy fence close to the rear of the building that did not show in the illustration shown tonight. Has the fencing been eliminated from the plan? This is from Susan Half. Hi, Susan. Um, anybody? Austin, do you want to take that one? Certainly. The, the fencing, and again, Austin Turner with Bowler, the fencing has not been eliminated. Um, it may not have shown up very, very distinctly on the rendering, but this privacy fencing that we had proposed previously is intending to remain as part of this application. Is it on the, on the, um, the, the um, neighbor side or on the, the um, dollar, the property owner side? It is on, um, I'll tell you right now, it's, it is on, it extends along, so I, I can just share my screen and show you that probably easier, right? Sure. Let's do that. So the, the fencing, you can see the screen fencing is this brown line that extends here and extends along the back corner of the building as well. So it's on the, it's on the neighbor's side. Correct. Uh, yep. And it extends uh, all the way across the, the opposite side of you know, the plain road intersection right. with Mill Village as well. Right. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amy? Hi. Um, Hi, Amy. Hi. Hi. I don't know what happened. My camera never works right. That's all right. That's all right. Oh, there you are. Um, so my first question is that um, as of 1.20 this afternoon, when I looked for the plans on the planning board site, um, the only plans that were visible were the 2018, November 2018 plans. They seem to have prevented some, presented some new plans today. 
We haven't had, none of the residents have had a chance to review those plans, to look at them in any detail. It's really hard to see them on your computer screen for, you know, the five minutes that they're showing. So I would ask that the, that the general, excuse me, I would ask that the public hearing be continued until the residents have a chance to review the plans that have been newly been presented. We don't know what, they're, what they are. Through you, Madam Chair. The, the, the revised plans, the plans that have been reviewed with you in detail, have been submitted to the Zoning Board of Appeals. They were part of the application. Thank you. Yeah, but they were not on the planning board. They were not on the ones we were looking at to review. They, they were submitted to the town. And I, I do think they are in the set. There are There is a plethora of documents. I never saw uh, that drawing with the colored. I'm, I'm sorry, I thought I was talking. Today. So they're, um, they're, they're, they're posted with a ZBA potentially? They were submitted. I think um, Ms. Uh, I, I think Ms. Gannett has been, been responsible for doing most of it. So I, I don't want to speak for her. She's done a wonderful job getting everything up. So I think it's in there. Uh, th I will acknowledge there's a lot of material there. So it can be hard to find it. But um, I assume that they're there. And if not, then I'm sure that can be uh, rectified in some fashion. Thank you. Jen? Hi. Yeah, I'm going to speak on this behalf. Um, uh, obviously, Casey and I started after this has been going on for quite a while. And then with the whole COVID and trying to do everything uh, remotely and getting it on the website. So there was some confusion of the placement because I did do a banner uh, that was on the front page of the website that um, was for the first um, ZBA public hearing. And then the other information started to uh, be put onto the calendar date. And some people were going to the agenda and not seeing the material there. So then as of yesterday, I asked um, Pat Kroll to like move everything into one location. So I'm hoping that it's just been places that people didn't know that it was. And unfortunately, we're all trying to deal with um, Civic Plus, and that's our, our platform, and COVID and remote and um, not having things, um, you know, paper copies sort of delivered to us with the way that it should be. And so, um, you know, we're trying to get all that information transferred into one location that everybody can find because I, you know, I've heard from residents, they're, um, you know, upset and, and frustrated with, um, with their, idea of lack of organization, but we are trying our, our hardest to get everything. Um, so where the public can, and you know, I'm like, just call me, let me, I can guide you to where to find the documents on our website. And um, so I apologize if things are not easily found. Um, I did put those um, 2019 plans in the remand folder. They're there right now. So I know that doesn't give you any time to but yeah um, I mean I Jen I completely appreciate the complexity of all this and how much what a volume of stuff you've been trying to put up there um, and my concern is really that it's very it's sort of hard and inappropriate for the public to make comments on things that we weren't able to look at so they were and all also that the that the applicants have frequently submitted materials like the day of the meeting so it's really hard, you know, to like keep up with that. Um, so that's just my concern. Okay. And if there's not, you know, I mean, I can talk about the various changes that were shown today that seem to me to be still problematic, mostly traffic and, and pedestrian safety. As a person who walks around that corner frequently and almost takes her life in her hands every time, um, the pedestrian safety is not increased at all. It's just not. The bend in the curves make it hard to see. Even when that that walkway is coming out, it's hard to see. Um, but I think that nobody can speak in any detail to things like that Darren Gray was talking about, about the elevations to the wetlands. Um, they have not paid attention to the concerns raised by various other consultants about the presence of wetlands just off the edge of the site. Um, they have a lot of things that they say we're working on and we're going to take care of and it's going to be in there, but it's not in there. And they haven't dealt with the question. They've talked about the runoff from the 
impervious surfaces, but not the fact that that runoff carries pollutants with it. So those pollutants will eventually make their way into Bloody Brook. Um, so there's a number of questions I still have, but mostly I just think we haven't, ha we haven't, the public hasn't had sufficient time to review these particular plans to make reasonable and informed and fair comments. That's, that's all I'm going to say today. Thank you. If, if I might. Yes. Just in just in response, um, uh, as we reach the 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 point that we, that Attorney Costa was talking about through the settlement, and it became at least evident that we were moving in that direction, uh, and the plans were being updated, we started the process before the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, that process started uh, back in January uh, of this year. Um, it certainly has received plenty of information. I didn't go to look at the website organization, uh, but I'm pretty sure that those plans have been on the site. I would suggest that any party who's been interested in this matter has been participating in it, has been reviewing the plans. The changes are relatively modest uh, from what was submitted before uh, in which your board held um, uh, five different public hearings during. So um, I, I think that to suggest that the public has been deprived of a fair opportunity is a facetious argument. Thank you. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna reply to that, that in fact, um, you well know that I went to every zillion board hearing because I talk all the time. <laughs> um, and I'm currently looking and the, the most recent plans I see, I see the traffic plan on the ZBI, on the website. And, the and then I see plans from 2018. So. Um, Thank you, Amy. I don't, know. I don't want to be unfair. I just want to be able to talk about what to talk about rather than just assume that it's as bad as I always thought it was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm. Jen? Okay, hold on. Let's see. John. Hey, John. I think if you unmute, John, I think you're all set. There you go. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? We hear you perfectly. Okay. Hi, my name is John Pareski. I'm a resident of the town of Deerfield. And I'd like to speak about section 5462 about safety on the site. Um, Jennifer, would you be so kind as to attach the site plan showing the truck turning around? I'm gonna, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> <That's a> <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's the, oh boy. You want to go ahead and talk while I try to figure this out? Sorry. Well, I really can't. I need the the attachment. You want to go to somebody else and you come back to me? How come it's not? There we go. You see it? We see. Um, that's not it. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. I have like this 13 inch laptop at home, which, yeah, no excuse. But. You want me to re email it to you? No, oh, I have it on my computer. I just am having trouble getting it from my. Sorry. 
Sorry. No worries. While we're um, while oh there we go. While we have a, a minute here. Um. Oh no. Um. I do want to just point out that our purview is very specific. Um. We're not the ZBA. Uh. The ZBA. Their 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 approach to this plan is is quite different than ours. Um. We are looking at these very specific, uh, land use issues. Um, that's our purview the, on the planning board. It is not um, the, the DOT, the, co the complexity for this program, for this, I'm sorry, for this project with the DOT. Uh, I appreciate their, their efforts to work with DOT. Um, this was a, uh, that was a concern for us as well. So it's not, it, I'm, while I, I really appreciate their efforts to work with DOT, it, it, they can work with DOT and we don't have that, we don't have that same press. Um, so that, that information also, I would love to have that on the, the website as well, Jen. I think that that would be very helpful for people to see that. Uh, we'll make a little list of things that the public really, really needs to see um, relative to our concerns on planning board. All right. All right. All right. Jen, do you want to move on to? I got it. Oh, okay. there here we go. go. Yep. Okay. Um, unfortunately, how can we make so I can? Good. That's good right there. That'll work. Unfortunately, I wish I could rotate it 90 degrees. I think you can. But I, hopefully you can follow this. Uh, again, I'm concerned the board needs to, I'm talking about section 5462 and I believe that the site is not safe as required under section 5462. I know Bowler Engineering in their response a letter dated November 2nd in response to um, FERCOG felt that uh, the project is designed to accommodate pedestrian movements interior to the site as appropriate. Uh, I think I disagree. I think the board should disagree. I used to be the CFO of a trucking company of the 550 trucks that ran coast to coast and with that many trucks and that many miles, we had accidents, of course, and a great number of them would because of backing. And in this situation here, on this site, a truck is going to come in here. If you, can you see my cursor? Mm -hmm. I don't know what you can see and not see. I can't see it. If no. you, this. See it? Um, it's going to come in. If you follow the arrows. This arrow? Yeah, but go to the right. Up there, yes. The truck's going to go up there. It's going to keep going. It's going to stop. And then it's going to start backing up. And as it backs up, a truck driver, all he can see behind him is what's in his mirror. And there's a huge blind spot behind the truck. And I think the board needs to be concerned about pedestrians crossing the parking lot get into the store, walking behind a truck that's backing up, and the driver can't see that person. And it's not only for trailer trucks, it's also for box trucks and vans. I know the applicant has mentioned there's going to be one trailer truck a week, and again, I don't think that's pertinent. I think it's the total number of trucks, and I don't see anything that's been done to make the site safer for pedestrians crossing the parking lot with trucks backing up. Um, in a, as an aside, the Dollar General trailer truck may not be the only trailer truck that enters the lot. Coca-Cola now delivers a lot using trailer trucks. But again, for emphasis, it's not just trailer trucks, it's box trucks and vans. They're all backing up with a huge blind spot and you can have people crossing the parking lot behind those trucks. Um, so I think that's very, a very unsafe situation. Further, 
Um, another issue I see with the truck traffic and backing up is when they come in, if, uh, can you take a cursor, Jennifer, and put it up at the, where the truck has stopped and is starting to back up at the end of the run the truck is doing? Left, 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 up, 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 up. Yeah. Okay. Say the truck is there and you drive into the driveway as a customer, you come into the driveway and the truck has started backing up and all of a sudden you're at the the end of the driveway, getting ready to go into the parking lot, and oh, in front of you, you have a truck backing up. You didn't know it was backing up when you drove into the driveway. All of a sudden, now what are you going to do? The other customer, are you going to have to back up, back up the driveway to get out of the way of this truck backing up? I don't think that's a very safe situation. And to compound it, what if there's another car behind the customer? What if there's two customers in that driveway? Now two cars have to back up to get out of the way of the truck backing up. So I have, I think that the applicant needs to make some accommodations for, uh, again, pedestrians crossing the parking lot with trucks backing up and customers coming into the driveway with trucks backing up. And that's my point of view on site safety. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, John. But do we have more, Jennifer? Okay. Lily. Lily, you're on. Hi, good. Hi, Lily Dwight, South Mill River Road. Um, I threw something in the chat that you can ignore then, Jen, okay? Um, so I have a few questions and a point I want to make. I have one question, and um, this, I think, is directed to Austin Turner. And um, where is the snow going to go when, um, in the earlier plans, um, I don't think, I'm trying to remember, I don't think the retention pond was right up against the hard surface and, and now there are all these plantings to the left of the picture right next to the parking lot. So where's the, the south, south, right? Yeah, where's this? Yeah, the south. Thank you. And it doesn't look like it can go to the east and without being pushed into the right of way, which I imagine the state's busy plowing snow into anyway which will also add to Bloody Brook, just saying. So where is the snow going to go? Through the chair. I don't mind answering directly if you're comfortable with me doing no, that's so. That's fine. That'd be great. Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the snow storage is pro proposed along the perimeter of the parking area. We talked about this actually at length. Um, and it's proposed along the bottom perimeter and the side left side of the parking area. And then there's a spot that's located between the loading area and the stormwater basin. The product is not proposed to use the stormwater basin as a snow attenuation area. So, so let me just be clear. When you say left side, you mean the south side also? I'll, I'll do. I'll do you one better, and I'll just. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll show you the plan. <laughs> yep. That will help. Yes. I'm assuming you can all see this now, right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So the the snow storage area is identified on the plans as as this area along the the, the, the bottom, if you will, in the left side of the parking area as well as this area. I'm sorry, but I thought there were shrubs there. That's what the, made the landscaping is actually located below this. We, we pushed them further down, uh, closer to the right-of-way boundary, specifically at the request of the planning board to accommodate additional snow storage okay. approximate to the paved surface. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, an, another question I have is on the um, actual page for South Deerfield DG Series LLC documents on the town site, there is a document called dollar underscore general underscore eight by 11 underscore Deerfield underscore 1018 dot PDF. And in that um, document, it actually shows it's a septic system. And I'm um, wondering is this the one that was approved 
It um, was done by uh, Environmental Design Inc. Can somebody on. answer that? No, Austin, is that a document that's familiar to you? Yeah, the the septic system, I, I believe that's accurate, was designed um, separately and approved, I believe, in November of 2018 by the Board okay. of Health. So my question is that in the septic design, it says that the retail space is 130 feet by 70 feet, saying that it's 8,901 square feet. But um, my calculator says that 130 by 70 is actually 9,100 square feet. But neither of those numbers are the same ones that we've been hearing all along. So that's why I was like going, well, if this is the thing that was approved, that isn't what is actually going on, or is this an old document? That's why I was trying to understand. And to the chair, if you don't mind. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the, the septic was designed for the building that's before, before the planning board this evening. The, the number that was referenced the 9,319 square feet refers to the small airlock that's required by building code in the front of the building. So the difference between the, the 130 by 70 dimension of the retail component of the facility is that small airlock that's in the front of the building that's required by building code. Just, you can't, you have to have that, that breeze, that, um, that bump out, if you will, in the front of the building to accommodate that, that bridge between the exterior and the interior of the actual occupiable space. But, but the building has been, the building that's before the planning board was the same store and, and dimensions and size that was included with the septic plans that were approved by the Board of House. I'm not understanding. It says, the septic plan says that it's 130 feet by 70 feet footprint. That's, that's correct. So the, the, the but, rectangle but of the building. 130 by 70. Um, in this document, they say that it's 8,901 square feet, but 130 by 70 is 9,100 square feet, right? I believe the, that number that you're referring to, I don't have that plan immediately in front of me. I believe that's the interior of the actual interior square footage of the building when you exclude the building walls and, and things of that nature. So that, that's probably where the difference, that's the actual interior usable square footage of the facility is my understanding. But you might want to check that document, Austin. You might want to go on uh, the site and just see that that's the same document that you're Certainly. I, I, I have a copy of that plan. I, I was provided a copy of the plan by the, the designer of the system. I'll go and confirm that. But my understanding is that the, the square footage referenced on that is the interior square footage of the building, whereas the 130 by 70 dimension that was mentioned is the exterior to exterior dimensions of the rectangle Great. That, is the, that forms the building. That's uh, on, I can confirm that. check that through just to make sure. I think Lily has a bit, you know. Yeah. Just in terms of you, you're being sure that you have that. You have that. Yeah, I have, I have a copy of that drawing. I, the I, designer I, of the septic system provided it. Okay, because I could put it, if, just if you want, I could put the link to it right in the chat. We don't chat, have access. If that makes it easier. We have access to the chat. You want me to, I can do that if you like. Mm -hmm. Hold on. We have a question and answer. Oh, there it is. I see it. Yeah, yeah, put it in. Would you mind, Lily? That would be super helpful. I, I can do, certainly do that in one minute. So, um, um, and I also wanted, I had two more points. I'm trying to be fast. Um, so, I wrote a letter regarding mass green dot yeah. and complete streets. And I, I apologize. I did not send it until last night. <laughs> but um, my, the main point that I would make is that the applicants have certainly proposed improvements for access to their store and potentially for that intersection, though um, I would point out that night illumination is light pollution and all the accidents have happened in broad daylight. But my real concern is that it is not better, it is a lot worse for pedestrians and bicyclists to get through that intersection with this modification. And Green Dot and Complete Streets are all about, and we're signed up for this as a community, about 
enhancing and facilitating alternative means. And in my letter, I, um, so the uh, applicant's traffic engineer, Mr. Kelly, has said that it's much too fast to put a pedestrian crosswalk there. But on Route 116 in Amherst, where the speed limit is 50 miles an hour, they have not only got a pedestrian crosswalk, they've got a carve out for buses. So it's an intermodal and it's a, then they have a bicycle lane. Um, so I just would strongly suggest that we can do more and we are obligated to do more by the commitments that we have made as a town. And my final point, and then I'll shut up and I'll slack you that link, um, um, is that I would remind the board that to something that John um, Presky was just saying, and that there was a woman killed in a Dollar General parking lot with this very exact scenario where the truck was backing up, and that was in December of 2018. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. And Lord. members of the board, I really appreciate you honoring the spirit of our democracy and hearing from your community, and we really appreciate your volunteerism. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, John just had a quick question back to the truck deliveries. He, he forgot to ask, um, how many deliveries per week will there be? How many trucks or vans will be making deliveries per week, i.e. how many deliveries per week will there be? Right. This is a question from before, too. Austin, you have answers for this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, that is, what's anticipated and planned for is one primary delivery per week. That's what's customary for a facility like this. And then you might see some some smaller vendor style trucks if, if it's Pepsi or Coca Cola or something to that effect that that may visit the site you know once or twice a week too. Those are harder to quantify, but they also don't require as much maneuvering space as the primary delivery vehicle. So those are harder to quantify. But from a primary delivery standpoint, we would customarily expect to see once a week. Do you have a data from other stores? This is kind of the thing that we were, we talked about before that that's one of the benefits of having a store that's, uh, that's rep reproduced from other similar sites. You must have data from some other site. Uh, I, I'm not privy to that information uh, per personally. And it, I, I suspect, but I don't know for sure that it, it's variable depending on specific geographic locations and markets and, and how stores are functioning. So I don't know that one store would be able to give you what would be expected for another, but generally speaking, it's one primary delivery and then the occasional vendor truck that might show up too. No, but there must be some, I mean, they must have some, even when there's a, like a construction site, they can t give us more of a sense of what, it's not one truck a week. So it's going to be more than one truck a week. We know that. And, no, there I, must, and I, I don't must, disagree with that statement. Than, even Berniston, we could, we, you could just give us Berniston's numbers, for example, that would, that would help us. And I saw I said Chad who Chad is representing the the owner. I expect he can speak to that answer perhaps as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for the record, Chad Brubaker with the Scotty Development. Um, you know, as is, this was discussed at length to, as as well back at the previous planning board meetings, and on average, there's one primary main delivery truck per week. Uh, as Austin has said, you know, you have smaller trucks, bread trucks, milk trucks, Coca Cola trucks um, that will come. We can certainly look and try to get. Um, additional information on that, but a lot of it is driven by demand. Um, you know, how quickly a store sells out of goods. I mean, it's not, a, you know, so, so we can get that, but as Austin has said, I mean, it's a pretty, um, you know, that's, that's the answer we've gotten in the past when we've asked. It's just one primary delivery a week and, you know, a handful of, of smaller deliveries, but, um, you know, we can certainly look into that further. I think there must be a comparable that you could give us a range. Yeah, and there was, and just just to bring up too, and this was a this was a key point at the last at the planning board discussions. There was some testimony that somebody had stood at a store in Greenfield and watched all the trucks, and this came up at DBA. And just to highlight that, is that was part of a strip center with you know multiple stores, an auto parts store who gets daily deliveries. It even had tractor trailer storage behind the building. So I just wanted to highlight that as a, I don't necessarily think that was a fair representation either of, of no and I think you know Dollar General did hit a bad patch of um, publicity with the death of this woman and a 
And I mean, so we understand that these are episodic issues, but it's still, there's a number out there. I'm sure there's at least a range. So that's, that would be great. The, 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 the number we've provided is the number that we're providing to the board for a 9,300 square foot retail facility. The general experience in the retail world is one tractor trailer delivery on a weekly basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But it was just said one main delivery plus a handful of others. So a handful is five. So that equals six. So that could be one a day. Certainly. I mean, perishables can be delivered on a much more regular basis, but they're not the large tractor trailers. Right. They're no different than the vehicle that's pulling up to your house on a regular day delivering Amazon packages. They're of a comparable size. But there is this issue of a big blind spot that has been brought up with well, all the th th there's, there's been what's been brought up is, is the fact that uh, when a vehicle backs up, there's a blind area for a truck. Um, that is probably true. It's equally true that training deals with that in some fashion and the drivers practice safe practices on a regular basis and are trained in that area. Uh, the fact that a truck has to back up in an area that only has one entrance and exit, as requested, um, it shouldn't be a surprise. There's, there's really no way to not turn around and back up. Much like every passenger vehicle in that, that enters that lot has to back up at some point. Thank you. Jen, more? Um, so John Pereski wants to sort of talk on that topic again. So I don't know how you want to address that. Do you want to? There are others that are. Um, there yeah. are. So John, make it very fast. Okay, I have to make him come up again. So you want to hear from John again? Sure. Okay. Thanks, John. Muted. You're muted. Back to it. There you go. I start again. I unmuted you. Attorney Donahue actually got back to it. Um, I, I think you. Were, oops, I lost you. Okay. You, you. Um, box trucks and vans are just as dangerous as a tractor trailer, in my experience. Uh, there's still a blind spot. Uh, maybe a smaller truck, but the blind spot is there and people are gonna be walking behind it. But that's it, I think I covered it, thank you. Thank you, John. Jen? Sure. Okay. So three minutes, everybody, because we're, we're, coming, we're coming into the end here. Rachel, Debbie? it's going to fade soon. Debbie? Hi, Deborah. Hi, Debbie. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? There you go. OK, good. Sorry, I'm. thank you. I'm here. Uh, I would like to just add one point to what was said about the, uh, the um, description of trucks arriving at the, I think it was the Federal Street in Greenfield Dollar General Store. The Deerfield resident who sat there for some hours on a day watching the trucks arrive was looking only at trucks going to the Dollar General. He was not watching trucks going to the other stores. So just wanted to clarify that and uh, because it's been uh, misrepresented. I'm going to address, however, uh, further uh, section 5461. Um, and these, I represented uh, much of what I'm going to say in a letter that came to the planning board, but may have arrived just recently. My, these are questions that I, from which I would like you to get answers from the applicant or other relevant boards or professional reviewers to substantiate applicants' claims. Um, and also ask that you obtain documentation um, not assurances, but documentation from the applicant or, or other uh, relevant parties. I would like to know if the construction of a driveway to access this proposed development uh, will result in the cutting or the damage of trees in the right of way, those newly planted ones, um, or mature trees that are already in the area. If they're going to be removed, and this is germane to the site since of course 
the site has to have access through a driveway, which will go through the right of way. If trees are going to be removed and impervious cover added uh, for the driveway, what are gonna be the likely stormwater impacts to nearby properties, especially the rock fossil dinosaur shop that's immediately to the north? And how much additional stormwater is anticipated for the two year 24 hour storm, also the 100 year 24 hour storm respectively? What accommodations will the applicant put into place to protect neighboring properties, just even from the driveway impact since they will be added into other impacts of stormwater coming off of the site. As Darren Gray pointed out, uh, the, um, um, at, a, at a certain kind of a storm, according to the, the diagrams, the detention basin is going to fill up and overflow. So uh, that's very likely going to be heading into the subject property. And I'd also like to just correct another assertion uh, that, that, uh, that the culvert wasn't connected to Bloody Brook, if I heard that if I was hearing correctly, I believe I understood that to have been said. Um, it, it does connect to Bloody Brook. Uh, we know we've had proven from the examination of a wetlands specialist and confirmed further by uh, um, the a representative from Mass DOT District 2 that in fact the storm drain at the south end of the dinosaur shop, north end therefore of near the uh, adjacent to the site, um, does connect directly into Bloody Brook watershed into that area. So any water coming off of that location is going to get into the brook. So that's a, an important issue. And I hope that the board would consider whether a third party should review, review information that the applicant provides around potential stormwater impacts and their plans to mitigate stormwater. Um, and as you know, I won't spend much time with the CONSCOM because but other than that, they are deliberating about whether jurisdictional wetlands exist in the state right of way. That's going on now. And they are uh, going to be working with a third party reviewer. Just think it would be helpful for the planning board to know that, have that uh, in its thinking. And, and I hope we'll wait, um, be, can take this into consideration and, and await their findings before around wetland congestions, just so you have that in your thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much for all you're doing. I appreciate it. By the way, my name's Debbie Shriver. I live on Pocumtuck Drive, so this can be in the public record. I think I have to do that, right? Yes, you do. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Yep. Terrific. Judy, is that, who's next? Um, Judith. Are you there, Julie? There she is. Did I do it? You look a little like in witness. There you go. Witness. Difficult. Oh, all right. Well, I'll have to say that I had, yeah, I had some of the same issues with finding documents of the correct date on the website. And I was one of those people that was surprised to see the newer plan. That's sort of irrelevant, but my point is, um, this evening, uh, I heard that Ty and Bond had approved the drainage plans and said that the, the basins comply with um, separation of groundwater. And the last thing that I saw in the folder was two letters from Bowler Engineering dated November 2nd, 2018, in response to peer reviews of Ty and Bond and Furcog. And in some of their responses, they made statements like, the applicant is willing to make any um, approval conditioned on certain things. So, um, Adam Costa has said that the board can condition approval of the site plan on certain things. I would like to be able to send, maybe I can send them to Jen now, of the conditions, many of them which they suggested themselves in that older document, I don't know if it's still valid, um, that they be, that any approval be, uh, include these conditions. And, and that's, 
that's it. Thank you. Do you have, do you want to elucidate the, con the condition? What are they? Uh, there, I have uh, 10 of them. For example, they need the vehicular access permit from Mass DOT. They right. said they have that, but we don't have any proof of that. They haven't provided it, it to us. Um, they said, um, Right, so the, per, the, the the information from DOT is one of the, the there, that would be a good list actually, because. Um, I'll send it to Jen right now. Um, so okay. I just sent it. So it's the vehicular access permit. They need an approved septic design. That's they need a non-vehicular access permit from Mass DOT. And again, the Bowler letter dated uh, November 2nd says that they're willing to do that. Um, yeah. So they've, they've said that they're willing to do these things. Yeah. Um, so they should be part of the conditions. A stormwater pollution prevention plan um, is anticipated to be provided prior to construction. Um, and that they, the applicant is amenable to a condition of presumptive approval requiring swap to be provided. So a lot of these things are based on their own suggestions. That's all I'm, I'm saying. Thank you. That's great. That's a great list. I'm sure that that Turner, that you know, Austin and company will can get on that. That's great. Thanks. As a matter of process, if I might, Madam Chair, yes. um, it, it's it's fairly common uh, if the board were considering an approval subject to conditions. Mm -hmm. that they would be provided to an applicant in advance so that we hopefully don't have to go around this merry-go-round again. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, you know, we're glad to take a look at whatever is being considered and give you our feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we're com kind of compiling them as we go along tonight, too. I think we're thinking about that as we go. Thank you. And you're hearing it as same as us. So, so that's great. Thank you. Judith, just state your name and your address. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. Judith Kundal, 22 Lee Road. South Deerfield. Terrific, thank you. Jen? Yep. Okay. Gina? Gina? Yes, hi, Gina. Hi, everybody. Thank you for giving me, I'll be very brief. Um, I'm Name Gina. I'm sorry. Name and address. Yes. I'm Gina Bordoni Cowley. I uh, own the dinosaur shop at 213 Greenfield Road. Um, I wanted to just um, talk really quickly about the uh, stormwater permit. So, um, and just sort of address some of the concerns that um, I have. Um, so, uh, you know, I, there will, since there will be um, impervious surfaces with the building and the parking lot, um, and so, which will create greater surface area, um, and so more water will be there, and of course it has to have a place to go. Um, I, I can just imagine um, the overflow and uh, the, the, um, the spillage that is going to happen um, at the dinosaur shop. Um, I've already experienced a lot of flooding inside and outside the shop um, since the um, trees were cut down. Um, and so um, I know that they're sort of counting on um, the, the DOT property to sort of help with some of that drainage, but um, I'm not real. I'm still concerned about that. Um, when the parking lot uh, gets flooded because the little storm drain can't handle all that water coming in, um, of course it creates um, a situation where people can't park in the parking lot or they're stuck in there and you know have to slog through all that water in order to get um, to their cars. So uh, so that's that has been an issue. Um, that I have brought up many times. Um, and then of course, there's the ecological impact um, in an area that, that is 
a wetland. So um, I know somebody mentioned the pollution from the runoff. Um, that's certainly going to be um, a bigger issue as well. Um, the other, the other point I want to bring up is the safety on the site. Um, I know that the driveway has been moved um, more, I think, north, closer to my shop. So, um, you know, I've raised concerns about that as well because there are, that's my parking lot, essentially. And there are families that are putting kids um, in and out of cars uh, in the summer. There are buses that have camp kids coming to the shop where they're loading and unloading kids. Um, and so I, I feel like, you know, that hasn't been addressed either. Um, and so um, anyway, that's just something that I wanted to bring up again. And I know John talked about the tractor trailers and the backing up issues. That was something else that um, I wanted to talk about, but since it's already been brought up a few times, I think, I think I'm good. Thank you, appreciate that. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Jen? Okay. We have Tolly. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Tolly. Hi, my name is Tolly Stark. I'm at 121 Keats Road. I'm also the chair for Deerfield for Responsible Development, representing not only myself tonight, but other residents of Deerfield and Butters as well. And I just wanna start out by saying thank you um, to the planning board for this uh, process. I think that this is really great. As many people have said, um, this plan is new to us. Um, and as our town council has pointed out, we're here to look at the criteria of site plan review and not the ZBA. So I think it's just important to note that, that we're looking at more technical aspects that we'd like to speak to tonight. And so we really appreciate you granting us the time to do so. Um, I also wanted to um, acknowledge that the, the applicant has been putting a lot of work into this and that we greatly appreciate it. However, there still are questions to be answered. Um, there's questions that we keep getting ambiguous answers to that seem like they should have concrete ones. So I ask also that the applicant team please be patient with the public and with the board as we all gather this pertinent information. Um, I wanna speak first to uh, 5462. So um, some of the concerns there, which other people have brought up, so I'm just gonna tick those off the list and not go into depth, but the fact that we don't have any crosswalks at that intersection is a great concern to safety. Um, the fact that Green Dot has not been met or are complete streets is also another really important thing for the planning board to be considering. And then I also was um, really concerned even more with section 5468. And in 5468, there's quite a few things. So one of them was we heard about um, the road being widened. And so this kind of will fall under both 5468 and also 5462. Um, one aspect of the road being widened is part of that safety and having turning lanes. Um, and to, as part of the criteria, as this being an egress, the planning board needs to look at that. Um, so as part of your criteria, that safety going to and from is very important. Um, we've heard the applicants speak to um, what they refer to as an old RSA. And I guess I would like to know how old that RSA is that they have been talking about with MassDOT, um, what, when that was conducted, um, what, uh, who was involved in conducting that. And also, were there certain businesses that have recently been developed that were a part of that or not? Um, I would also really recommend that the board consider requesting a new RSA of this applicant so that we are getting all of the information that will show us what we could do for maximum safety and what we could do for minimum safety and see where their proposal lies so that we can have a true barometer of how safe it, it actually is. But with 5468, I think it would also be really important to see with the widening of the road, um, what is the calculation of impervious surface there? Polly, can you just back up for one second? RSA, when you say RSA, what are you talking about? I'm sorry, um, a road safety audit. Yes. 
Um, so going to the road widening, um, I think it would be really great if the applicant could supply the board with an actual calculation of that impervious surface and how much runoff water would be going into the culvert and then calculations if the current culvert can handle that or not. As many people have already said, we have a big issue with culverts here in Deerfield and they're very expensive for the town. And when they fail, especially if this fails on a main route, um, and connection to it, we're gonna have a big problem in town. So I would like to see those calculations for that impervious surface area and calculations of whether the current infrastructure can support that or not um, added in there. Thank you, yeah. And also I think it would be really great if the board would reach out to the um, Massachusetts Environmental Protection Agency and um, request um, an opinion from them um, to kind of get their advice on it, considering um, the state permit that be required from Mass DOT. Um, with the mapping of these parcels, they were considered um, farmland of unique importance and areas of prime farmland um, and hang of fields in recent years. And all of that falls um, under MEPA. So I would love to see what their opinion is um, as this site plan is developed. I think that would be some crucial information for the board. And um, lastly, I just want to um, talk about not only getting more specific information on the hydrology that other people have mentioned, perhaps having a third party looking at that just specifically, um, but also the, the septic design um, that we know of is with that old plan, not the new revised plan. So um, I think it would also be really great if um, on the very least, along with all the contingencies um, that we get a new design plan to look at that's actually going to be approved by the, the Board I'm of sure, Health. Thank you. I'm sure that um, yeah, there's <laughs> Attorney Donahue and I'm sure that Austin um, Turner will be willing to provide that for us. I can't imagine that's that would be something forthcoming just to No, we're not, we're not going to provide it. We, you know, there, there is no specific design for the expansion of the roadway within the state right of way, Septic. which was what yeah. there were a number of things asked for, and I'm responding to at least that litany of things that were asked for. Right. Um, and we're we're not going to provide that calculation in any fashion. Um, the discussions with regard to MEPA, um, uh, the the uh, the speakers raised this uh, before. We've dealt with it before before the ZBA. It has nothing to do with your jurisdiction. And I, um, I, 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 I could address that as well. I mean, I think are the speakers urging us to look at that, and not necessarily you. I think at this point that is a crossover piece. We can look at it. That's fine. I do. You know, of all the things that we're we're tending to there, we, I think the recurrence just. I know we, I know this is available. The septic with topography is available. I'm sure Austin can provide that for us. And that will be a good clarification piece. I think we have two more people to listen to tonight. I'd like to just quickly get through that. Um, and if the comments at this point, we're really marking, we're, we're nearing the witching hour for Rachel Blaine, who <laughs> turned into a vampire at some point soon. Um, so if we could keep those comments very strictly in the lane of um, traffic, yes, for sure, but safety um, and safety, but um, of things that have not already been mentioned, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elissa Clement for B. Evans Lane. I'm a direct and legal abutter to the development. Um, and so there's just a few things. Um, the I had put a Q and A in that um, back when Sue. I, I don't think it came through um, when Sue was asking about the fence. I just wanted to ask about the um, the plantings on the property line. What the um, species size, spacing, that sort of thing. What what we're looking at there. Oh, Austin, like you want to that that? I think that's pretty straightforward now. Yeah, um, so the, with respect to evergreen plantings, the, the size at, at planting is listed on the plants is eight, eight to 10 feet. Is um, that when they're planted? That's correct, yeah, that's, 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 the, that's the planting schedule on the plan shows that they would be eight to 10 feet when at the time of planting. Uh, 
evergreen shrubs would be approximately 30 to 36 inches in height. And then there's also some ornamental grasses and, and things like that, which are measured by container size as opposed to height, which is approximately two gallons. Um, so I'm sorry, the, the 30 to 36 inch, is that the spacing or the height? That's the, that's the height for, for ground cover shrub plantings at the time of planting. Okay, then, but the ones, the, the tall ones that are along the fence are eight to 10 feet? Yeah, the, the, the plans that suggest eight to 10 feet at the time of planting in okay. height. And do you know the spacing on those? Uh, they are, are, are spaced such that they'll, they'll essentially immediately abut each other so that there would be, the intention would be that there'd be a solid wall where they're planting. I don't know what that spacing is specifically but there's a mix of species. Some of the larger ones are gonna be interwoven with some of the smaller species to, to provide some continuity and synergy there. there it, it, it varies depending upon the specific species, but the landscape plan speaks to that specifically. You can see the, the symbols and the planting arrangement on that plan. And that's, is that on the town website? The, it should be, yeah. In that, yeah. in that level of detail. Okay, I haven't seen yeah. that level of detail, so. Um, it's, it's on the, it's, it's the, there's a landscaping plan that's towards the back of the entire plan set. So. Okay. I mean, I've seen it on just the little row on the drawing, but you mean somewhere that actually specifies like these details that I'm asking for. Yeah, you'll see the planting details as well as symbology of where the plants are intended to be located. Okay. Um, and related to um, Darren Gray, something he said, so you've talked about the elevation change from east to west. What about north to south? Because for the neighbors that are on Evans Lane, they're at a much lower elevation than the ones that are on Mill Village that are towards the, um, the west. So the north to south line on that property line there, what is the elevation change and then where will the runoff go with regard to that? I think, I think we had kind of addressed that, but just to reiterate that point that generally this, this, this site flows, the highest spot is at the rear of the property where Mill Village Road is. And that's also consistent with the condominium development um, which which is a bit higher than the the, the subject property, um, and then that's the runoff or stormwater, you know, both in the existing condition and as we're mimicking the hydrology in the post condition, it, it generally drains in the direction of routes five and ten. It's, and then as you go north to south, um, the elevations vary a little bit, but generally speaking, and approximating uh, Mill Village roads at approximate elevation of two twenty four. And you know the opposite side or the, the northern boundary, it, that has the most variation. It goes from high to low along that edge. It varies from elevation approximately 230 or 231 uh, as you get down to the lower corner of the property, approximate elevation of 223. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess I'm concerned about the direction when you're looking at where the development will be and when you dr go directly over the property line, whether it's um, to, the, to the condo property or, so you're talking, I mean, I understand it goes downhill from Mill Village down to Route 5. I'm talking about the line perpendicular to that, going into the condo property and the dinosaur. I think it's, uh, I mean, it may be something that we want to just get a little clearer vision of down the road, Austin, that, that topography. And we'll, we can yeah, I, I can bring up the grading plan again, just you know, kind of like I did in the beginning without making this uh, a giant science experiment. Um, so as you know, as I've shown in the previous, previously in the kind of opening statements, th this you're referring to this this line here. So the pose grading on on the left side of the image, if you will, is between elevations 228 and 227, which is consistent with the existing condition, and then the property has this general gradient, which is kind of top of page to bottom of page, but also a little bit of a cross slope. Um, the elevation down in this corner is about elevation 223 or 222, which is consistent with, with the existing condition. And as I've mentioned before, we have to mimic the way stormwater flows. We can't all of a sudden start breaking watershed boundaries. So we're, we're mimicking that hydrology as well. So we're not changing any of the drainage patterns, you know, in terms of how the direction that water is flowing in the existing condition. Thank you, Alyssa. Are we good? Can we move on? Yeah. No, I, I, well, I can move. I mean, is, can I, address a couple other things? Quickly. Okay. We do have um, one person and we're, we're running short of time. 
Okay. Well, I just, I am still concerned about the flooding in our area. I understand the direction it goes, but we don't have the mature trees anymore. I also just wanted to mention, I also am concerned about um, having answers on the widening of the road um, and the movement of the driveway, what trees will be cut down now, how that's going to affect water drainage. Those are all big concerns for us. Um, the, um, Let's see, I'm, I'm, and I am concerned about having, some of the details have been glossed over, other people have mentioned this too, but I am concerned about having real data on trucks, signage, all that stuff, I'm sure you are as well. On, on, sorry, what was it, and signage? Oh, um, trucks, oh, how truck. many trucks, we've discussed that already. So. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, just, I just, it just concerns me that some of the details keep getting glossed over, and I think we all want Real data. Well, I think we're gonna we're we're gonna get some answers that 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 we're gonna give. Um, let's get to Lori, and then we'll we'll maybe ask for some specific things that the will move a little bit. That be, maybe gets more answers. Thank you so much. Appreciate your concerns, and thank you for coming tonight. This is great. Thank really you. helpful. Lori, this last one. And there you are, Lori. Oh, okay, start my video. Let's see if it's Lori that I think it is. It is the Lori you think it is. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. Hi. So your name and their address. Yes, Lori Busada, 193 North Main Street. Mm -hmm. Not officially an abutter, but essentially across the street. I want to thank profusely the planning board for all the time that you're taking to look into this um, in detail. I want to let the um, developers know if you feel impatient that this is our home. And so this is something that um, we realize that we are gonna get stuck with. I was biking from Greenfield down Mill Village Road when the motorcycle accident happened. I was told by the police officers to turn around and bike back to Greenfield or wait half an hour before I could cross the road. So that was um, pretty powerful. I have been living here for 30 years. This exciting idea to install flashing beacons to enhance safety were there before. They didn't last because they got hit and driven over and broken multiple times. That's why there is no flashing beacons there now. Mr. Kelly stated the condition of the road and the signage and the striping. So am I to understand that Dollar General or Liscotti is going to maintain the striping? Will it look beautiful on the opening day? And then what happens after that? There are bike lanes in Greenfield that are just a ghost of what they were before. So unless this is something that is committed to to be maintained by DOT, I, I cannot trust and I don't see why we should trust that, that just because the developer is gonna put some striping down that it's going to preserve turning. I also see turning left into the store when you're going north. What happens if you wanna exit the store and go north? You have to cross traffic again there. I don't see that um, the stripes on the road are really gonna take care of a road like that next to an intersection. There are other locations in town where there is not an intersection nearby that would be much more appropriate. I will also say that this intersection is not much different than the intersection at Elm Street and Greenfield Road, Route 5 and 10. And at that intersection, there are crossing lanes, there are crossing lights, and there are stop signs and I can cross there safely. I don't trust that we would be able to do that here. Thank you, that's great, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so that actually pushes us to the end, is it not, Jen? Are I we just wanna, there's one other question, but I think we addressed it um, from Susan Hoff. It says, when trees are cut in the new driveway, will there be, um, yeah, we, we did that, right? Abandoned current existing driveway, the, the one that was abandoned. The, the new, the, the new um, driveway, what, what will be the, like that does fall in our purview. 
what trees, what vegetation will be impacted by the new driveway of uh, more than six inches caliper or whatever, right? That's what she's asking. I'm not looking at it. Sorry, I should be looking. Sorry, I just said it was answering. Go to the answered in the middle of the Q&A. Oh, it's all good. Yeah. Well, I think at this point, and I appreciate, um, I have not been um, as attentive to the ZBA um, as I maybe should have been. Um, I've been, have more of a, so I appreciate the, let's see, let me just make sure that I've got this. Okay, sorry. Ah. There we go. Um, that the, I appreciate the patience of the applicant. Uh, I know this has been a long process and obviously it's in, involved um, some litigation as well. We've, we've got attorneys present and um, I, I like to think that we can move uh, through something um, in a civil way, which I'm appreciative of the tonight's commenters. I know there are a lot of people who are very committed to their, to their um, concerns and I appreciate the civil nature that they have presented, um, how they have presented them. It's been really great. Um, I do think that we have a little bit of a list of things that we'd love to see. I hate to push it back, but I don't think that there's a, a possibility of us really being able to deliberate on our, basically what is, you know, our nine points for sure. Uh, there are some that we feel a little bit that have kind of moved, moved from one column to the other, but we're not, um, we're not there with the last ones. And I think there could be some things um, that we would love to see. Um, and I know one of them, Jen, has to do with our website and really making sure that we have what we need to put in front of our uh, constituents, as was pointed out, I think, by um, somebody just recently, that this is our home. And um, this is a, a business, a, a building that will be house one business, but will be there beyond the business that it houses. Um, and so we want to make sure that it, it's, it, it works. It works in a big way, not just for um, this one business. Um, the traffic concerns, I think, have been addressed to some extent, but not as thoroughly as I think we are we are really looking for. Um, I think some time to look at those, um, the, this collaboration between, um, but between you and the um, DOT is very hopeful. I think that sounds exciting, but I, I think we're very eager, if you hear the comments of our, our um, public uh, speakers tonight, the, the Green Streets Initiative is really something that Deerfield is committed to. Um, we've seen it work in other places and we want it to work for us here in Deerfield. And so you're getting right in the midst of that because this is a place um, of deep concern. This particular stretch of five and 10 um, between you and uh, other developments, there's a school turnoff, there are all kinds of turnoffs that we're concerned about. So this one actually it falls very clearly in our high concern um, place. So I think a per, that would be one thing that we'd love to have a little bit more clarity on how that works. Appreciate the fact that you have done a lot of the things, obviously, that we were really concerned about. Moving the driveway, I think that was a significant um, improvement. Um, and now we just want to kind of look through that and say, what, what is that, what does that take now? What is the tree concern? We need to look at that. Um, and that may take us a, a, a little trip to walk out there. I don't know. Um, I think too, uh, pursuant to some of the other concerns about the septic, I think we're, this was a concern that we had previously. I think a topographical, like to be able to see that, um, the septic plan. Um, so I feel like this is just a kind of a, a punch list of things that we need to see before we can actually really deliberate in any kind of um, serious way or any kind of really considered way. Um, I hope I'm being... Um, I, do, you wanna, do you want to talk about these as you go through them? Or because the, the, right now I don't have any direction of what most of what you've said indicates that you're looking for. And, and I think it's a pretty far afield from where we started this meeting, which is what can happen when you uh, let a meeting go on, uh, of, of a remand based upon a number of discussions about a number of improvements that involve the public way. So when you say how the Green Street Initiative works, that, that, that doesn't provide any guidance to the applicant. 
So I think at this point we need to see, we have, a, we want to see a, a more clear understanding of how pedestrian and bicycle traffic moves through that area. We really appreciate the work that you've been doing with DOT. This is not necessarily in your purview. It is not- Madam Chair, not, not to interrupt, you, your jurisdiction is how pedestrians and vehicles move inside the site and at the driveway. There's been no question asked, but we're glad to provide the information as to site distance, which was provided previously. Mm -hmm. It was reviewed by Ty and Bond mm -hmm. as far as site distance and the ability to adequately egress the site. That's your jurisdiction. It, it's not beyond that. The general improvements that we're making are making the general area safer and helping, therefore, that issue of egress. How bicycles can move through the general area is not within the purview of site plan approval. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been a subject matter of discussion. We had these discussions. I, I don't want to I, I, I don't want to breach the confidentiality of, 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 of settlement discussions, but we talked about how bikes would access the site. We responded in a manner by putting a bike access point in where was agreed upon was the right place to be. This sounds like just a rehash of things we've already talked about. And we can't do that. That's not, that's not where this matter is. This is not the first or second time that this board is getting it. We, we went through five public hearings and litigation. We're at a point that, that it's time to bring this to closure. Well, I, I sense your impatience. It's um, not impatience. I'm not, I'm not concerned about not coming back. I, I don't, I'm not asking you to stay much longer than, than we have to, but I don't want to leave on some general wild goose chase of go look at a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, stormwater, I, I think a point's been missed on stormwater altogether. Three members of the planning board voted to approve the stormwater permit. They made specific reference to the review by Ty and Bond and the fact that the plan complied to read from the decision designed to meet the requirements of the Massachusetts stormwater management standards and the Deerfield stormwater regulations. Three members of the board already found that. All these questions about stormwater, are, first of all, weren't raised as anything that needed the applicant to change as the course of the litigation, was already been reviewed and although the, the site plan was unanimously denied the first time, three members of the board recognized we had met our burden of proof with regard to stormwater. Yeah, I hear you. Um, as, not, as one of those who didn't vote, I mean, I, I still have concerns. So unfortunately, you're, you're left with some that did not feel that, uh, uh, and and so I would I would put it out that without moving to a place of high contention, that we just need a few more answers, and I don't think that they're not available. I think they I, are. Available. I need to know what the question is to provide. Well, that's the what I'm trying to get to, and I guess maybe I got I got going down the wrong road with bicycles. I'm sorry. The Green Street Initiative is very important in our town, and I, I'm sorry that that is a trigger for that. We do appreciate the effort to put it in. So that's terrific. Um, it is a, a, a corner that is, causes us concern. That's, that's, that is just, you're, you're hearing it right here. Denise, Rachel, go ahead. Rachel, may I speak? Denise Mason. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do have a number of concerns. It was interesting, as you know, I am a new member of the board and I have attended some of the meetings in the past. And, you know, I'm just going back to, I believe Judy Kundal had said this, and she was asking about proof of the DOT permitting, the septic revised plan, the stormwater pollution plan. So, I mean, there are a number of things that I think she has on the list that I'm sure that we can provide you with. Um, I, you know, after listening, I, I have some, some big concerns about vehicular safety. Um, and I, sorry, sorry, but I still have concerns about the stormwater runoff. And I think, um, Debbie, Debbie Shriver mentioned, you know, someone said, no, the culvert does not connect. Well, in fact, it does. So I've got concerns about that too, possibly misinformation. I, I, I don't know. And I would really like to hear um, the, um, the final from the CONSCOM 
we don't have that information. So, you know, I, you know, I just well, sort of well, feel like uh, I've got uh, bits uh, and pieces. Yeah, it's site plan approval, okay? okay? In order to build the building, we have to get a septic plan. Right. Your board already found, your board already found that as it relates to your criteria about grand, groundwater contamination from on-site wastewater disposal, that we had met our burden that the plan does minimize contamination of groundwater from on-site wastewater disposal system and any hazardous materials stored on the site are to be limited in quantities typical to, to similar retail. We, we've already met that. We have to get a, a approved septic plan from the, from the town in order to build the building. A SWIP plan is required by somebody else at a point in time. You know, the Conservation Commission will make its own determination and it will run its own course. Mm -hmm. You don't get to have a collection of permits before you act. You particularly don't get to do that on a remand. If this well, board, if the majority of this board has a concern about stormwater, then deny the site plan based upon stormwater. And we'll go tell the judge that's what you did. Mm -hmm. Well, forgive my ignorance, but I'm a new board member, so I may not be asking the appropriate questions. You obviously have a lot more you know, you've done this a lot more than I have. So, you know, please forgive if I've asked, you know. There's no, reason, there's no reason to ask for forgiveness for the bad career mistakes I've made in my life. So don't worry about that. Okay. Madam, Madam Chair, Madam yeah. Vice Chair. Yes. May, may I attempt to try and rein this back in a bit? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, man's, especially remands that occur uh, two years after the fact present some real challenges. Um, in this case, we've got a couple of new board members, and so statements have been made, and I, I appreciate that they've been made, and there's, there's accuracy to them, that um, findings were made by the previous board. Um, those findings are documented in the decision. I, I cited to some of those in my introductory remarks as well, and in the, in the screen share that I provided. Um, but those were findings made in part by a couple of board members who are no longer board members, and weren't necessarily findings made by the board members who now are board members. And so that, that lack of continuity, both as a matter of time and as a matter of membership of the board, presents some challenges. Um, you know, I, I think that there, there are sort of two sides to the coin here. Um, on the one hand, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not telling the board how to vote or how to act. I learned a long time ago in my career not to do that. I don't tell boards how to vote. Um, I give you legal advice as to what the standard is, and I make recommendations as to the strengths or weaknesses of certain findings and conclusions if they were challenged in a, in a court of law, and the decision making is up to you as board members. Um, with that said, we are here on a remand. So there's some truth to what Attorney Donahue says. The typical remand is a one night event. The typical remand is a uh, confirmation in a public forum of a deal that was made previously, um, where the board affirms the commitments it made through settlement and uh, discussions had an executive session, and then that's that. The public can make comments, the public has an opportunity to challenge the ultimate decision. At the same time, because of the passage of time, because of the different membership, uh, there were a few items that were still, in some respects, outstanding. I can recall the executive session I had with the board even after our settlement discussions, uh, which of course only involved representatives of the board and not the whole board. Um, comments and, and concerns that were had about certain outstanding items and whether there be the ability to discuss those anyway um, in, in a remand hearing. And I think the advice I gave at the time, and I, I'm not, I'll give it now because it's not anything that is truly privileged, even though it was said in executive session, was that certainly you can ask, but the idea is that through settlement discussions, there was acknowledgement that some of the things you asked for you got, or were going to get if you approved it on remand, and some of the things you asked for, you weren't necessarily going to get. I mean, that's the very nature of settling a lawsuit and the end is just sort of a confirmation and memorialization of that settlement. So I think that to the extent that the board has outstanding items, I'm not here to tell you you can't continue this proceeding. I've said to you, Madam Vice Chair, in our conversation earlier today that um, we'd sort of see how things played out tonight. Um, the remand order doesn't specifically say you're permitted to continue it. It also doesn't specifically say you're not permitted to continue it. Um, I think that it should be a discussion with the applicant and the applicant's counsel. And I think that to the extent you do continue it, my recommendation is that you continue it with specific guidance, specific questions that need to be answered, 
specific request for additional information that you think you need that is within your purview, that is within the criteria in the bylaw, mm -hmm. plan approval, or for a stormwater permit, mm -hmm. so that the applicant knows exactly what's required of it. And if it acquiesces to a continuance, or if you choose to continue, continue it despite no, a lack of acquiescence, mm -hmm. we end up back here in two weeks or three weeks with a substantive discussion and a closure of the hearing as to that not occurring and us ending up back in a courtroom um, debating the merits of a site plan, uh, site plan denial, which is, which is, you know, puts things in the hands of a judge as opposed to the hands of your board. And there's always some uncertainty involved with that. So I do think that coming up with a list of items, again, items within your purview, and that also not just goes to the nine, the nine criteria in the bylaw, but also recognizes that as much as you may want to regulate what occurs within the roadway, the roadway is beyond your purview. It's beyond the purview of any entity, any, any subsidiary of the town, and it's beyond the purview even of the applicant. MassDOT is going to do what MassDOT wants. It's nice that MassDOT a year ago uh, inquired as to what the town's priorities were. It's nice that it gave the town an opportunity in that email that I, that I recited for you to express its preferences, its concerns. But ultimately, it's not your call. It's not the applicant's call. It's MassDOT's call. So I think we need to sort of remember that too, for better or for worse. I don't like it any, any more than you do, but it's just the reality of dealing with a roadway that's a state-run roadway. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry if that came across that I was asking that. And I'm actually very appreciative of the efforts that the applicant made on behalf of the site in order to improve DOT's attention to that spot. That is not in any case what I was interested in insinuating that, um, th that the applicant needed to make changes to the, to the plan of DOT. I just think it's really helpful for us to have a stronger understanding of what their or negotiations were with DOT so that we can see. And I, the, the plan as it sits, I, I just haven't sent, spent enough time with it. I suppose that's you know all on me, but I have not sat enough with it. I know that those were some of the concerns that we expressed um, as moving into negotiations because we had concerns about that, that the safety of that location, which has nothing to do with what they can actually change and the work that they've done with DOT we really appreciate. Um, I think that the septic issues that we'd like to see clarity around the site, the plans that we were concerned about that Lily Dwight mentioned, um, this was something that we had seen before. Uh, Darren Gray also mentioned it. We'd also like to hear more about um, the 24 hour to 100 year storm. I think plans for that. A pollution prevention plan uh, would be very nice. Is that in our purview? Is that beyond the scope? I have no idea. I think that would be a really positive step on the part of the applicant to, um, to uh, um, address some of the concerns that were presented tonight. I also think that um, the number of trucks at a comparable store, I think that would be something that we could bring forward that would also maybe allay some of the concerns of people tonight, but certainly address that. Um, I don't think that that's an unreasonable ask. Um, you know, similarly, um, the concerns around the color, that if it's color that was used previously, photo of an, another building with that color, I mean, that's something I had early from the evening that's so minor, I can't even believe it. Um, I think that, you know, continued understanding of um, the truck safety, I think just addressing that one more time, looking at that, seeing, what kinds of uh, innovative solutions that uh, the applicant can, uh, you know, look at, uh, give it more assurance that this this truck safety issue that um, that that is in our purview, that is a concern that has been brought up, not just you know, not just two years ago, but then again today, or not just today, but two years ago. Um, Anything else? I've got stars by all kinds of things. Um, May I inquire? Yes. Uh, you, you made reference to more information on the 100 year storm. Yeah, the, it's the, great. The, all of those storm events are modeled in the drainage calculations that were submitted. 
and were also then reviewed by tie and bond. Okay. So when you say more information, I'm, I'm not clear on what that, what that means. Well, I guess we'll look up tie and bonds. I'll have to look at that again. I'll just go back and look at the information that was presented to us by Ty and Bond. I, I, I suppose that's there. That's our that's that's our information tonight that we need to look at. It is um, it is something that we're not I, secure about, which does lead me to the idea that we just need more work on this. We have we would ask for a continuance. We have a November second date. We already have a meeting date for that. Um, that Monday, it's the first Monday in the month, which is our regular date. Um, we might have two of our members back who were previously on the board when this was uh, first, you know, considered. Um, we have two members missing tonight. Um, so that would be, it would be, it is also almost 10 o'clock. And um, as somebody who has other things to do. Uh, 10 o'clock is really pretty much it for me. Um, and so I'm not eager at this point to uh, close the meeting and make a decision based on this evening. Um, so so, so let, me, let, let me just try to go back through this list and understand so we understand. Yep, you want I'm us to- be asking also other members of the board not to just to let me be the one to um, put this forward. If you have other things that you as on a list, because I think that's what Attorney Donahue is looking for, is a list of things that he can do to help attend. We need to do some work in the town offices, maybe to make this clearer to our, to, to, to clarify for our public the kinds of things that they're looking for and clarity that we have information for. So go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, you want clarity about the septic plan, and, and I think we can clarify the approved septic plan so we can yes. Submit that in advance. You can have the topography. It. That, that would be that tonight. The topography was something that people were very interested in. So if, if that could be included in that plan, that would be great. Okay. Uh, with regard to the various year storm events, what we can plan to do um, next time is ask Mr. Turner to provide just a synopsis of his report and um, juxtapose that from the conclusions from Ty and Bond. So it will be at least a condensed. Um, cliff note version, for lack of a better term, of the two reports, if that'll do it. That'll be you're, looking to, you're looking to get an idea on the number of, of total trucks, both um, tractor trailer and type of delivery that would be anticipated on a daily or weekly basis. At a similar you, want, you want some further review or analysis on options around the issue of truck safety. I take that to be the the interaction of trucks and pedestrians is the pr yes. primary concern. Yes. Okay. And bikes. Same. And bikes. Yeah. Not non-motorized vehicle. Right. Okay. Was there anything else that I missed? <sighs> Anybody else? Max. Annalie. Denise. Uh, maybe. Uh, comparable. I just wanted to get the. Just the clarification, I know I keep going back to this, but you know what, I just remember when when we had Irene and all the flooding and I'm just still concerned about the stormwater and the runoff into the bloody brook because you know, when we have a heavy rain, you know, look, I don't know that first house when you go on North, uh, North Main Street, there's, oh, it's, it's flooded. I mean, it's like a swimming pool. So I, I still have that concern about, you know, cause I got mixed messages about whether the culvert actually drains into the Bloody Brook, and then someone said yes, someone said no. So I just want clarification on that, please. We, we, we can certainly, can, you know, at least provide the information or get you the information as mm -hmm. to where the culvert goes. That the okay. culvert is off-site. I, I don't want any mm. confusion about that. Oh, okay. And, okay. and it's not the obligation of the applicant right to either review or improve the culvert, except as instructed by DOT as part of the access permit. And that's what Mr. Turner talked about, the increasing the okay. cross culvert uh, underneath okay. the driveway. Okay. Um, you know, our, our, our obligations um, to some extent end at the property line mm -hmm. of the, the, the requirement right. to attenuate storm events. Yeah. And that's what the stormwater report demonstrates. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, I, I think there might be some, uh, it may be misconstrued that when we say it's it's 
not there, that somehow we're questioning whether there is flooding. It's, it's not really that's the question. It's right. more that it's not really part of the development in some fashion. It's somebody else's responsibility. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that clarification. Uh, you know, and regardless whether it's under your purview or not, it still is something that we need to consider that, you know, it, it could potentially happen. So. It's, well, it has with, with all due respect, I, I don't think you I don't think you can can consider whether there are issues in this state culvert as a as a reason to either approve or disapprove or condition site right. plan approval. True. True. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Annalie. You're you're muted, Annalie. Annalie. Changes in the landscape due to the changes in the driveway. We had talked about additional yep. trees being removed and planting of trees in the old driveway. Good. That too. Max, anything? So, um, we would like to ask your uh, permission to continue. Uh, we need your uh, consent, uh, Attorney Donahue, um, to move forward with this. Um, so if you are willing, that's what I would propose to the board that we um, continue this for one more meeting. Um, and I, I would propose we push it to the November 2nd meeting. We've been meeting on so many things um, between uh, the other issues that we're facing. Um, I think this kind of tucks in there. I don't know if anybody would like to. Yeah, you know, just one other, one other comment, Rachel. You know, I, I really do. I appreciate all the work that you have done, Mr. Donahue and Mr. Turner and everyone else. And ju you know, just to remind you that we are new board members and I do apologize if I'm not totally up to speed with everything, but I feel like I'm getting there. So I, I really would appreciate having a continuance of this. I don't, let me, let me take the suspense out of the room. There's, there's, there's no doubt we're going to continue. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, um, I, I'm just, uh, and I, and I guess, um, I'd ask, I don't know what other people's schedule is. I'm actually, uh, you said the second, right? Well, that's just our net, that's our regularly scheduled meeting. We've got some others in between, but that would fit in well on the second. Look at my schedule. Yeah, we have a few other things before us before our annual town meeting. Mm -hmm. Economic development waits for no disease, no virus. <laughs> yeah, right. That's good. So can I make a motion that we put this that we continue this discussion on November second? Could I just ask when after the second your next meeting would be? Well, Even probably, my client will kick me under the ta under the proverbial table. All right, um, we meet re we meet on the first uh, Mondays of dis of um, the month, and we have been meeting pretty much uh, like every week, every other week for the last four or five, because we have these other issues before us. Um, so mm -hmm. we're not likely to schedule another one in, except if that is you know that's what works for you, I suppose. Uh, November second, I guess. The following seventh, November second, yeah, is a Monday, and December seventh, and December seventh would be our next regularly scheduled meeting. Okay. Did you say there's a meeting next week, or you did not? Well, that was this is for the annual town meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Are we also having a public hearing on December seventh for another issue, the formula-based businesses? Right. I mean, we have a lot of things before us. It's not like, it's not like we don't, but we could. No, I, I, we no, could. no, no good deed goes unpunished from deciding to go on the planning board. So I, I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, um, you know, if, if the choice is November 2nd or December 2nd, then I'll, then we'll have to make um, in some fashion, November 2nd work. So okay. we could look at the 16th if you guys wanted to do that. <laughs> I do not want to do that. Okay. November 2nd it is. Adam's giving us a big no. So I made that motion. Does anybody want to second it? I'll second it. Who was that? So Max. Max. Oh, good, Max. 
and Mary Cloutier. Um, yes. That we end the meeting. I uh, know, sorry, that we move the, the, we continue this public hearing, um, is, sorry, remand meeting until November 2nd, seconded by Max. Um, all in favor, let me do a quick roll. Annalie Wolfkill. Annalie Wolfkill, yes. Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Max Antes. Max Antes, yes. And Mary Cloutier. And Mary Cloutier, yes. Rachel Blaine, yes. So there you go. We passed. Do you have a time, Madam Chair? I think seven is the consistency of seven o'clock works for us, if that's OK. okay. Um, we're getting old, and we only can remember certain things. Seven o'clock, it's like, I get seven o'clock. We move to six, I'll forget. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you to our public. Thank you to our applicant. Thank you to our, our um, council. And many thanks to um, Jennifer, our assistant town manager, who, assist, who is gold. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Mason, Mason moves to adjourn. Second? I second it. And Mary Mary Mary. Seconds. Anna Lee Wolfkuhl. Vote. Yeah. yeah, Anna Lee Wolfkuhl. Yay. Yes. Oh. Anna Lee Wolfkuhl, yes. Yeah, Denise Mason. Denise Mason, yes. Max Antes. Yes. Max Antes, yes. Mary Ann Cloutier. And Mary Cloutier, yes. <laughs> it is definitely bedtime. Bedtime, Rachel. I agree. Um, we're voting to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Uh, we'll see you on the second. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.